Again, welcome to the College of Complexes. Okay, so without further ado, we will come to our speakers. Oh. a little bit different from the typical um, format that, that you guys have. Um, we're going to have kind of a panel presentation. It's going to be divided into three segments, about 15 to 20 minutes each. Um, but that should leave us plenty of time for discussion. I, I'm going to start off by providing some insight, hopefully, into why so many experts are uh, from all different arenas are, have been sounding warning bells about the economy. Glenn will then discuss some of the key features of the NEED Act and um, the need for monetary reform in general. And then uh, Steve will provide a recap of the work that he and um, his friend Keanu have been doing to forward the message of proper monetary reform. So without further ado, let's get started with some doom and gloom, shall we? Oh, I can't wait. Hey! We're doomed. Hey! It's actually pretty hard to miss it unless you live in a cave, but um, we'll, it will go over it anyhow. Um, we don't have to rely on uh, Nouriel Rabini, um, also known as Dr. Doom anymore, because we have plenty of other people who have joined the course. Just as an example, we have this from MSNBC's bottom line last September, and I'm quoting, fresh evidence of a global economic slowdown has raised fears that governments around the world may be powerless to reverse it. If the world does fall back into recession, that's what they're calling it now, uh, it could be much harder to escape than the contraction that ended in 2009. Now, this global economic slowdown, of course, will affect the United States. It may even be led by the United States, should all the various headwinds uh, combine into a perfect storm. We have, for example, the um, fast-approaching fiscal cliff that involves some $1.2 trillion in combined automatic tax increases and budget cuts that was put in place last um, summer by congressional mandates which were supposed to be the default method by which Congress would be forced to feel, deal with the federal deficit. And as D-Day approaches, uh, the media noise about this one issue alone has been ratcheting upward. Just this past Monday, the IMF declared that if the U.S. failed to take a decisive action to avoid this fiscal cliff, the economy could go into a headspin and drag down economies around the world right along with it, maybe sending all into uh, negative growth territory, which in the current monetary system means um, more job contractions, more uh, bigger tax hikes, less social benefits, and on and on and on, you name it. Uh, the, next, the very next day, Tuesday of this week, in testimony to Congress, Ben Bernanke said that the economic uncertainty is increasing and that the, our economy is at risk of imploding due to the significant stress it's been under. Two of the main sources, of course, are the, the thing that's happening in the EU and also the fiscal crisis. Now, one can only imagine the human costs of a so-called second dip in as much as the impact of the first are not only painfully still with us, um, at least here on Main Street, um, but, you know, they, they continue. Uh, in fact, this last June 25th, just a few weeks ago, a fellow by the name of David Rosenberg, who is chief economist and strategist for a firm called Gluskin Chef, uh, described the current economic situation as a modern-day depression. And he had several reasons for this, starting with the fact that 46 million people or one out of every seven of us are living on food stamps as of 2011. That's a record number I'm of coming. Americans living on food stamps. Then we have the massive 40% drop in median household wealth in just three short years, 20, 2007 to 2010. Um, much of that, of course, but not all of it, is due to the housing bust. And Rosenberg himself notes that despite recent signs of stabilization in housing, the market, the national market, uh, will remain depressed with nearly 30% of mortgage holders underwater. And you add to that the 2.8 million households that have not made a mortgage payment in 12 months, and you can see the picture is not pretty. 
Then there is, um, on Main Street anyway, then there is the unemployment um, problem. Um, the country is still down 5 million jobs from its 2000 peak, despite um, incremental gains in jobs being added um, to the economy. Our un real unemployment rate stands at around 14.8%, and it's double that in the 16 to 25 year old category, which is why um, college graduates in particular are facing an especially hard row with all the debts that a lot of them have incurred and the bankruptcy laws and on and on and on. I could go on, but you get the picture. The current economic situation is bad enough without having to contemplate what a second dip might bring. At the root of the problem is the global glut of debt, both public and private, coupled with a relative shortage of money. The usual tools that have been employed traditionally by the Fed Tweaking interest rates and the money supply simply aren't working anymore, and so we've seen a host of non-standard tools, like uh, most of us never knew existed, quantitative easing um, and operation twist and so on. These tools really have been directed largely toward fending off deflation in the U.S. We've had disappointing results, as these numbers I just gave you have shown, and not a few unintended consequences. For instance, the low interest rates are punishing savers and forcing, um, you know, a whole lot of stuff like that. Um, in some respects, though, we have to recognize that the level of economic strength, uh, strife that we see um, prevalent <coughs> throughout the economic, uh, European Union is actually indicative of what might, have, what might have happened in the United States had the Fed not engaged in those uh, massive money creation policies and the, and the federal job, the government joined in their job stimulus programs, puny as they were. <coughs> and now we find that deflationary worries have spread to the EU and beyond, so, so much so that we are finding those like gold fund manager Egon von Greyer, ironically enough, who are predicting that there will be a global implosion um, that will occur unless we get massive money creation by the central bank. The problem with this so-called solution is that it does not address the solvency or debt problem. It just kicks the can down the road, so to speak, and it makes the solvency problem worse over time, especially for the great unwashed masses. This whole problem really is one of simple math, and once you understand it, uh, you're, and you'll be able to break free of your mailboxes and promote, hopefully passionately promote, real monetary reform um, of the system. The math involves two interrelated problems. The first being the fractional reserve system, about which Thomas Jefferson went straight to the heart of the matter when he declared no one has a natural right uh, to the trade of a moneylender, but he who has the money to lend. The other part of the problem has to do with the manner in which um, interest charges within such a, a, a system accumulate according to mathematical law to the point where debt becomes unpayable. Just as a very oversimplified example, everybody knows that 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? But what happens when you try to create $4 of money as credit or debt? which Jefferson and company called bank paper, and then have to pay the dollar interest. In addition to that $4, well, you end up with a shortage of money relative to debt. You simply can't pay off that $5, with four, uh, $5 of debt with $4 of money. But that is pretty much what we've been trying to do. You can get a more detailed explanation in my book, The Two Faces of Money, but for the present, I want, I'd like to show you that this is not a new idea, even if it's been somehow overlooked by almost everybody. Fact is, throughout our history, we've had plenty of very well-respected people who have remarked on this problem in a variety of different ways. I'm going to start out with a guy by the name of Arthur Kitson, um, and he wrote a book called Trade Fallacies in 1917, and he related in that book uh, the 1914 threat of the collapse of the English banking system, and he's discussing, uh, he comes to a, a, an improper solution for our situation in particular, but he's discussing the predictable role that bank credit serving as money plays in the economic crises, and he writes, a simple arithmetical calculation will show that production does not keep pace with demands of interest charges. Some 20 years ago, I showed, that would have been, you know, 1895, I showed that even in a country as rich in natural resources as the United States, 
The claims of capital outran the capacity of production, and hence periodically, wholesale bankruptcy and starvation was inevitable. A bit later, Kitson explains the all too predictable response to threatened collapse um, as follows. The generosity of the government saved the banks as usual at public expense. Any, any familiarity here? Uh, the entire credit of the nation was placed at the bank's disposal, which enabled them to open their doors, remain in business, and avoid a receivership. The nation was compelled to take all the risks, while the bankers took all the profits. If at that time the government had seized the golden opportunity of reforming the nation's monetary system, uh, instead of catering to the private interests of bank shareholders, they could have affected one of the greatest <coughs> and most valuable economic achievements of modern times and gained for the nation incalculable adv uh, advantages. Now, Kitson was English, of course, but there have been many, many, many U.S. counter, uh, counter uh, parts throughout history who leveled the same kind of criticism at the, at the monetary system and offered constitutional, um, constitutionally faith, faithful, actually, um, uh, reforms. I'm just going to start um, with uh, uh, Charles Lindbergh Sr., father of the famed aviator, contro controversial aviator, who in 1913 was in Congress, and he, this was prior to the enactment of the Federal Reserve Act. Um, and he expressed the problem with bank money um, in the following way in his book, Bank, Banking Currency and the Money Trust. He first starts out by discussing the problems created by the fractional reserve system, and then he moves to the um, interest problem. He writes, all of the money in all of the bank and trust companies is only slightly in excess of a billion and a half dollars. And the banks owe approximately $20 billion. There's not enough money in all their vaults to pay one-tenth of what they owe. There's not enough money in the whole country. The banks should not be condemned for this, however, because it's the only way in which the business of the country can be carried on under the present system. Every student who has carefully studied the subject knows that the people as a whole, which includes themselves as individuals, um, the general government, the state and municipalities, cannot pay interest on all the money they have agreed to pay. That is because money does not create itself. Since in our current system it takes a dollar to pay a dollar debt, there are no dollars left to, with which to pay the interest. The annual interest alone contracted to be paid on these obligations probably exceeds all the money in existence. Of course, some of this interest is paid from interest, other interest that's collected and is offset, but the greater part of it still remains to be made up from other sources. The only way that interest can be liquidated, considering the statement in its general application, is by transfer of the property or the services of the debtor class to the creditor class. But all the interest cannot be paid in full, even in that way. The geometrical progression of computing interest accumulates too much over time. And the creditors have a corner on us. How are they enforcing settlements? It's being done in several ways. We are compelled to work more hours per day, receive less pay per hour, pay more for what we buy and receive less for what we sell. This means absolute destitution for great numbers. That's clear enough, I think. Anyway, there's another well-known commentator. Is this yours, on sir? Well, uh, monetary system. Um, his name was Edward Kellogg, a self-made merchant who had been ruined by the Panic of 1837. So this goes back a ways. He, after that uh, he was ruined, he devoted himself to a study of international finance. Um, he, through his studies, came to understand and wrote many influential treatises explaining why it was that a nation's currency was a creature of law that was rightly created by the government, just as the Constitution says it should be. He was influential for um, uh, many um, after him, that came after him, including Henry Carey, who was um, economic advisor under Lincoln, um, and the populace and the greenbacks. Um, so his, his influence was fairly widespread at the time. It's not like he was not known. I'm going to share a few relevant excerpts of his writings. Uh, um, and in they go. The most important fundamental law in any nation is that which institutes money. For money governs the distribution of property and thus affects in thousands of ways the relations of man to man. If wrongly instituted, it cannot be rightly governed by any subsequent law, and the wrong distribution of property consequent upon it must corrupt society in all its branches. 
The Ill evils engendered can never be remedied except by altering the fundamental law of the monetary system. Changes in the subsequent laws, so long as they are founded on a wrong base, can only result in the exchange of one evil for another. Among pol political economists, the nature and regulation of money appear to have been subjects of utmost difficulty. From them, we have no full account of money's functions and no satisfactory answer to the numerous and perplexing questions which arise concerning its value and regulation. The alternate abundance and scarcity of money and the variations of interest are supposed to be irremediable evils. It would seem also that gold and silver inherently possess a mysterious power which defies all regulation and renders impossible a comprehensible monetary system. It is doubtless true that while the nature of a thing is not understood, all attempts to regulate it must prove ineffectual, and legislative bodies have hitherto instituted money in a very imperfect way. The money of a nation instead of being a power by which a few capitalists may monopolize the greater party, part of the earnings of labor ought to be a power which should distribute products to producers according to the labor expended in the production. Now, a bit later, he goes on to make an important distinction between the legal value of money and the actual value, and he relates it back to uh, that concept of production of labor. But I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Uh, we're going to go to the, back to the founders themselves. John Taylor of Caroline, himself a Jeffersonian, remarked in 1794 that banking, as originator of the nation's currency, Banking, in its best view, is only a fraud, whereby labor suffers the imposition of paying interest on the circulating medium, our currency. Then in a book published in 1814, Taylor explains, uh, he, he talks about the concepts of money and what it is, what its function and role is. But um, the part I want to relate to you is how wealth extraction and distribution um, play a part in um, a bank paper serving Thank as money. He writes, if no new banks should be created after 1808, when the acquisitions of the old increased, the $5 million annually collected by the existing banks at compound interest carry from the public to the corporations in 20 years above $184 million. <coughs> Here is already a vast current of money and power running one way. Will those check it in whose favor uh, the current sets? Are the receivers as regulators of power and wealth of undoubted confidence? Pretty good questions, even for today. Thomas Jefferson was a student, uh, a serious student of many, many subjects, and money was one of them. And he wrote um, fairly extensively on the subject right from the beginning, before uh, the Constitution um, was even written. A lot of his writing, though, has to do with the heavy critiques of what he called bank paper, which served as money. And I've got an excerpt that I'd like to share with you um, from a letter that he wrote in 1813 to his son-in-law, John Epps, who was then a leader of a power block of Democrats in Congress trying to stave off the creation of a second national bank, which would um, also uh, use the nation's uh, currency. Jefferson writes, the scheme is for Congress to establish a national bank. This state of things is to be fastened on us without the power of relief for 40 or 50 years. That is to say, the 8 million people now existing, for the sake of receiving $1.25 apiece at 5% interest, are to subject the 50 million people who are to succeed them within that term to the payment of $45 million, principal and interest, which will be payable in the course of the 50 years. Then in a later segment, Jefferson writes, first harking back to the Hamiltonian plan and then forward to the contemporary situation of banks issuing credit, money and credit. He writes, at the time we were funding our national debt, we heard about a public debt being a public blessing that the stock representing it was a creation of active capital for the element of commerce, manufacturers, and agriculture. This paradox was well adapted to the minds of believers and dreams, and the gulls of that size entered bona fide into it. But the art and mystery of banks is a wonderful improvement on that. It's established on the principle that private debts are a public blessing that the evidence of those private debts, called bank notes, became, become active capital and element the whole commerce, manufacturers, and agriculture of the United States. Here are a set of people, for instance, who have bestowed on us the great blessing of running in our debt about $200 million, 
without our knowing who they are, where they are, or what property they have to pay this debt when called on. Nay, who have made us so sensible of the blessings of letting them run our run in our debt uh, that they have exempted we have exempted them by law from the repayment of these debts beyond a given proportion. He's talking about reserves here, which at the time were a third about. And to fill up the measure of blessing instead of paying, they receive an interest on what they owe, um, which we see in circulation. Uh, they, what they owe from those to whom they owe for all the notes or evidences of what they owe, which we see in circulation. Uh, no, let me say that again. Um, they, uh, to fill up the measure of blessing instead of paying, they receive an interest on what they owe from those to whom they owe for all the notes or evidences of what they owe, which we see in circulation, have been lent to somebody on an interest which is levied on us through the medium uh, of commerce. So we're getting taxed twice that way. And we're so ready still to deal out their liberalities and they are so ready still to deal out their liberalities to us that they are now willing to let themselves run in our debt ninety million dollars more on our paying them the same premium of six or eight percent and on the same legal exemption from the repayment of more than thirty million of that debt when it shall be called for now what did the Jeffersonians then believe should serve as a nation's currency? Well, in modern day parlance, good old government issued money, which is to say, as Jefferson said over and over again, non interest bearing treasury notes bottomed on a tax that would redeem them. The result of that kind of a system, as envisioned by Jefferson, was expressed in another letter he had written in 1811 to a couple of years earlier to a general, Thaddeus Kosciusko. I hope I have that pronouncement right. He writes, Knowing your affection to this country and the interest you take in whatever concerns it, concerns it, I therein gave you a tableau of its state when I had retired from the administration. Peace has been our principle, peace in our interest, and peace has saved to the world this only plant of free and rational government now existing in it. If it can, be, it can still be preserved, we shall soon see the final extinction of our national debt and liberation of our revenues for the defense and improvement of our country. These revenues will be levied entirely on the rich. The business of household manufacture being so now, now so established that the farmer and laborer clothe themselves entirely. The rich alone use imported articles. These were luxury items primarily. Um, they used to call them like they gauze and doodads or something like that. Anyway, he writes, the rich alone use imported articles, and on these alone, the whole taxes of the general government are levied. The poor man who use not, uses nothing but what is made on his own farm or his, by his family or within his own country pays not a farthing of tax to the general government, but on his soul. And should we go into the, that manufacturer also, as is probable, he will pay nothing. Our revenues liberated by the discharge of the public debt and its surplus applied to canals, roads, schools, and so forth, the farmer will see his government supported, his children educated, and the face of his country made a paradise by the contributions of the rich alone, without his being called upon to spend a cent from his earnings. However, therefore, we may have been reproached for pursuing our Quaker system, one of relative austerity, uh, compared to the guys who were loading themselves up with egos and bottles. So he says, however, therefore, we may have been reproached for pursuing our Quaker system. Titan will affix the stamp of wisdom on it, and the happiness and prosperity of our citizens will attest its merit. And this, I believe, is the only legitimate object of government and the first duty of governors. So, today, we do have a solution. It's called the Need Act, which, in my opinion, is by far the most. Uh, it harkens back to that Jefferson vision. Um, at least over time, it has the potential of doing that. Um, it's the most constitutionally faithful monetary reform proposal, at least that I know of. Uh, the best ones ever set before Congress, as far as I'm concerned. And with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to Glenn Fritz. Thank you. I'm, I'm 
came up, a, a person who uh, read uh, uh, Stephen Zerling's book uh, a few years ago, and I was impressed by it. I read it and uh, uh, kind of stuck along with uh, going to his meetings and listening to him talk to a lot of people, and I was very impressed by the ideas behind it. Uh, and his, the idea, one of the big things is he, he, he tried to impress upon people is that money doesn't have to be debt. That, that money is something that uh, a government can uh, issue to its population, put into circulation without borrowing it from a bank. And a lot of people say, well, this just can't happen. You can't, you can't just create money out of nothing. And, and yet, we know that's exactly what happened uh, when the banks were bailed out. Uh, we had we had money created absolutely out of nothing. And so we had the Federal Reserve all of a sudden decided that the economy was so disrupted that they created fifteen trillion dollars out of nothing and uh, restored all of the failed capitalists back to the position as capitalists once again and uh, took up all of the the mortgage notes and uh, the derivatives and all these uh, collateralized debt obligations and, and redeemed them at base value. These were just failed, failed instruments and yet Yet the people who are supposed to be knowledgeable and know what's going on and know how to run the country and know how to make everything work for us, the people that we should be trusting, wound up getting very wealthy and they walked away, took their bonuses and said, have a nice life. Okay? That's, that's where they're at. We have, we, have, we have a problem with kind of accepting that the situations that we live in to, uh, are somewhat like the weather. It's the weather comes and goes. It's sunny one day, it's hot one day, it's cold one day, it snows one day, but it's just the kind of thing we all endure. We all get together and we all just kind of struggle through the best chains of day to day itself. And we kind of assume that somehow the, the money system is like that, that there, there's some kind of operating system that goes on that's not, not serving any private interest, but it's just we're all in this together. Maybe people like to believe we're all in this together, but there's some people that are really in this way, way far ahead of everybody else. Okay, and, and maybe people would like to like to know that. Uh, Stephen's plan is it's very it's, it's very it's interesting. It's very simple. It really calls for something that's really uh, a rare commodity in this nation. It's it's sort of it's democratic input into issues that concern us. His plan, and this is where this is where I think that some people have some problems with it. I know I do. That that when we ask for the people to be to have some kind of idea presented and explain to them and participate, in understandings is should we have some different distribution of money? Should should the money just go all into a handful of uh, 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 one percent, or one tenth of a percent, or one hundredth of a percent of the population who just dances around the world as leaders on some of the world stage and conquering worlds and building militaries and bringing all just glorifying them. So this maybe that's really maybe that's not what we really want. Maybe we maybe we like to have something uh, 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 a way of earning a living in the way we're, we've been accustomed to live with doing and working and getting up every day and going to work and, and doing something useful that's, that's constructive and needed by other people. Um, that's, that's, I think, is acceptable to most people. I think people go to work and they have some kind of idea that may not like being there for all that time of the day, but they feel that when they've done, they've accomplished something and they've done something for the family, they're, they're paying off their houses, they're doing these kind of things. And that's very different from people who just run on speculation. Now that's a that's a that's a flaw of the capitalist system itself. Uh, I just finished reading uh, a, a book this morning by Hyman Minsky uh, about John Maynard Keynes. He describes capitalism, uh, and he describes the the flaws in it, where things just happen; they can't get rectified by themselves. We've been for the past thirty years. We've been going on the thing of the idea of. Uh, it's the ideal system. It shouldn't be touched. It. It'll work. It, it's the invisible hand, and it works by itself. And, and Alan Greenspan was of the opinion that if there's any problem with capitalism, that if things, if there's a bust, we'll just come in there and straighten it out and fix it. 
uh, that trickle down is going to work for everybody. It's, 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 been, it's been on a trickle down. Well, if trickle down was going to work, it would have worked in 1929 when all the wealth was concentrated in the hands of a few people. If trickle down was going to work, if we start working in, in, in 2008, we'd have been poised for the greatest recovery on earth in 2008 because the wealth was concentrated in the hands of a small number of people. That, maybe it's a good sales pitch, but it doesn't really work. And we have evidence of that on a day-to-day -day basis. We know that whatever is selling to us, it doesn't, it doesn't belong in our kitchen table. Maybe it belongs in our garden, fertilizing our gardens. Okay? Uh, we have we have a, we have a, a, a difficult uh, a time here, and sometimes people don't understand what's happening, and kind of getting caught up in the day-to-day -day thing. We forget about things, and, and I, I'd like to uh, read a little short little quote here uh, by someone I think you'll recognize the name after you hear it. But uh, the um, the person said, "If we have a faithful flaw in our national character, it's forgetfulness." This failing speech speaks well of our human decency and generosity, but not always for our political wisdom or intelligence. We think everyone else is as good-natured as we are. These words, it's in the quote, these words were spoken by the, to the, about the German people by Joseph Goebbels. It's a great little bit of propaganda, a great little flattery to people about forgetting things, but we do forget things because we, we're hitting a, we've got a 24-hour news cycle and whatever we hear today, it's going to be gone and swallowed up in the next news coming up in the next day. So we don't really remember as well as we should all the things that happened. We don't go back and look at 1929. Uh, I was just amazed reading the book how similar things are to, to 1929. The, the, uh, John Maynard Keynes' book, The General Theory, was written uh, in, in 1935, and, and this book by Hyman Minsky was written uh, in 1975. And I see so many things in this book that demonstrate this, this, the system of capitalism, how it works, where the flaws are, and, and where things go wrong. The thing that I'm impressed with about uh, Steven Zarlenga's position is this understanding that money does not have to be dead. We do not have to borrow from these people who have created the problems. We are, if we are a democracy, that we are able to create the things that we need by ourselves, for ourselves. And we are sufficient as a people. We are not dependent on some uh, uh, aristocracy of finance capital to borrow the money from. There is no reason that every time money is issued for any public purposes by our government to do something that we need, such as uh, bridges that are falling down, or uh, health care, uh, or uh, to, to rectify some problems that we have with, with uh, widespread debt because of errors that the people in power have made and have benefited by, that we should not have to pay any any amount to, to the people who cause the problems, and that's what interest on the national debt is. We do not need to pay to those people to borrow money for government purposes, to pay to them to fix the problems that they cause. That's not what we need to do. It's not if we're a democracy, we don't need to do that. And if economics is a science, we don't, we, we should be able to inspect the algorithm by which monetary decisions are decided and, and understand how things happen and why they have, there should be an algorithm, there should be something to, to public knowledge, there should be open information, it should not be done in a secret session behind closed doors, uh, uh, it brought out in public by the, uh, uh, the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, brought out it in that nation, uh, to the nation in some kind of uh, uh, obscure language so we can just we're going to bet this way or bet that way. What is Greenspan? What did he mean? What did he say? This is the kind of information we get from our government because things are being done secretly. They may as well be doing it in a foreign language. But if it is, in fact, a democracy and our government and its policies and its way of introducing money into population and into circulation, if we are a democracy, if we, if, we, if we choose to hold our government to account for that, then we have no we have no use for things done behind closed doors in secrecy that benefit a political few 
and leave everybody else spinning out wondering what's happening. We, we have a situation right now, and Hyman Minsky uh, wrote about this, again, John Maynard Keynes wrote about this, is where we have a situation where uh, we have what he's called a liquidity trap, which is a situation where people who are in uh, see uh, disruptions in the economy coming, and they say, you know, I'm not gonna buy anything, I'm gonna hold out the money because I don't know how secure my job is. And I've got some money that I've put away in a 401k, but I don't know if that's gonna stay up or not. I better not, I better not keep it in there. I better take it and, and get money with it because at least all my debts are due with money and I'll have money on hand and I'll be able to pay my rent, I'll be able to pay my, my, my bills, my utility bills, because it's all due with money. So everybody wants to hang on the money as a, as a, as a security because it's, it protects people. You, when you have the security, you've got some money that at least you're going to meet your bills. You know that. Any other assets can go up or down. Another another issue is the uh, uh, the uh, debt deflation. When people find that all of a sudden uh, the economy goes into collapse, uh, the the value of your capital assets, such as your house, uh, your stocks, and your 401k, whatever you have, when these things drop in value, uh, you find out that, that you're not as wealthy as you thought you were. And then you're, that the, the, if you if you wind up being one of those people that are caught up in, in unemployment, then you'll find that that uh, your debts that you took on while you were employed become a much larger proportion of your income than than they were when you had a regular full income coming in, and that's debt deflation. So we have a situation where people have debt deflation. I have to look at some of these uh, housing housing uh, uh, records here of, of the basically the last last I'm, I'm sure I think it's about the, the last year somewhere in there we have houses how many houses are being sold and the, the astounding thing about this this record of, of, of uh, market watch here it, it's is that we have houses that are being sold and let's say, uh, for example, we have in this plains, uh, uh, near, it's near O'Hare Airport. It says, so there were 619 homes sold. 182 of them were sold because they were in foreclosure. That people are losing their homes because they cannot make the house payments that they did make at one point in their life. This plains, they're not the million dollar houses. That, that's not that kind of a, that's not that kind of a community. That's not a very well. So it comes out that 29.4 percent of the homes that are sold in the last year are sold because people can no longer afford to make their mortgage payments. They've gone into default. They can't sell their house because they're underwater. Which means in order to release that that mortgage note, they're going to have to come up with cash somewhere to close the note to get out of it. They have no option but to walk away and lose equity in their home. Wait, a couple of years ago, uh, Senator Durbin was quoted on a radio broadcast uh, saying, because there was, a, there was a process at one time called cram down, where, where mortgages that were uh, unpayable because the, the, the house, the value was too high and people were not going to foreclosure. In order, in order to prevent foreclosure, have people stay in the house, was, there was a, a, a court process that was called cram down. Senator Durbin tried to have this, this cram down enacted. He said, we can't, we can't have this law passed because, frankly, the bankers own this place. This is where we've come to. We do not regulate our government, but finance capital regulates our government. When, when, when we try to regulate our government and we try to vote for something, we have, we have candidates and we have policies that come from behind closed doors. We don't know what's going on. Um, when, when the people who are going to run for president or office, they meet with their finance people first of all. And then we get to give our imprimatur on that after the after the decision's already made. It, it, it's to me, it's it's there's not enough accountability. Uh, one of the things John Kenneth Galbraith uh, said is that lowering the interest rates doesn't do anything. 
because if people are in the liquidity trap, they're still not going to have the jobs. They're not going to be able to do the consumer. They're not going to be able to buy the things they need. People are not going to have the jobs making the things they need. This is what a liquidity trap is. We, we get stuck in a lower and lower level of employment, a lower level of spending, and all we have is people talking about austerity. We need austerity. This, this is what we're getting everywhere that we have. We cannot run debt. I agree. We don't, we don't need to run debt. We need to issue the money with, in a democratic process, uh, a, a proved public public informed process uh, to relieve the debt and, and to uh, uh, get the economy going again. This is, this is the kind of thing that is not going to happen with the people that are owning this government right now, the people who are regulating it, and the, and the regulations coming not from our elections, not from our votes, but it's coming from the dollars that are coming from the finance capitalists. Capitalism is unstable. It regularly collapses. It needs tweaks. There are all kinds of things that happen time to time. The Federal Reserve, everybody's listening. What is the chairman of the Federal Reserve saying today? It needs tweaks all the time. It's very, very unstable. It's collapsed over and over again. It will continue to collapse. That's the nature of the system. What we can allow is the, the people who are in the position to extort. When we, have, when we have the finance people coming into the Congress and saying, we need $700 billion and we need it right away, and if you don't give it to us, we're going to collapse the entire economy. That's extortion. That is, that is, that is not something that a government that, that's run by, the, by a, 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 a population, by, by people, should stand for. When, when, when politicians run for office, they say, I'm going to bring jobs to Wisconsin. I'm going to bring jobs to Illinois. I'm going to bring jobs to your state, to your community. And what does that mean? That means I'm going to uh, cut taxes for the corporations so they don't have to pay. Everybody else can pay, but the corporations are going to get a subsidy from us. They're going to get free services. They're not going to have to pay. And what else are we going to do to get jobs here? We're going to have right-to-work laws. We're going to make sure that wages are down because corporations love to come where the wages are low. Well, we had a situation like that at one time in our, in our inglorious past. Jobs are not everything. Slavery was about jobs. Nobody really wanted to be a slave, though. It's not the, that's not the way people want to live. So don't sell me a low-wage job. Don't sell austerity. We had a problem. Germany had a problem with austerity. And what did we get? We got some wacko come up there and say, I'm going to conquer the world. That's really not the way we want to go. We do not want to present a situation to the U.S. economy where we're going to get every wacko with every strange idea coming up and say, we're going to end austerity, or we're going to live with austerity. We're going to get out from under this by engaging in wars all over the world. Anyway, I had a bunch of notes here, and I'm not going to get to them. <laughs> I'm out of time, so I'm gonna. I'm just gonna. Let the central banks go bankrupt. Fuck the banks. Yeah. We need to go back to the gold. The question is then for tonight. Oh, thank you. My name is Stephen Walsh. Um, I spoke here twice before. I spoke to you on the seniorage problem, and then Charles, myself, and another gentleman, we spoke on creation. I have an anthropology background. I don't know if you remember, I brought uh, fossils of um, Ramapithecus and Australopithecines and a few other uh, early hominid material. But I went from there into environmental science, and then I after 9-11 and a few years after that, um, I felt the human-to-human -human problem rather than the human-to-earth problem became crucial and I went into a religion or monetary reform and I picked monetary reform. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I thought a bit about religion and morality r relative to money too. But the question tonight is double-dip. Where are we headed? And I'm just going to give 
a one-minute summary to Jerry and then to Glenn, and then I'm going to go on, say a word or two about the NEDEC, and then I want to tell you what outreach is being done. Um, I, I'm a member of the Chicago Teachers Union, their leadership group, CORE, and I'd like to tell you what they've done. And then I want to tell you what young people, I've been to um, England, and I've been working with two groups in England on this monetary problem. So I want to give you an up-to-date information, and then I want to see where you all can come in on this, too. So let's begin. The double-dip question. Jerry, Geraldine Jerry, gave a tour de force of the interest rate problem. And remember, the math there is you create $4 of principal, but you've got to pay interest. That next dollar of interest it hasn't been created, therefore you have a 25% foreclosure rate. It gets that simple. The, Glenn talked about the collateral problem, and that's housing. When housing values go from 400 to 200, or 700 to 400, etc., that's less actually because money comes into our economy in the present system as loans. And 70% of all banking loans is housing and mortgage loans. So when those, the value of those loans go down, there's less money in the economy. And mathematically, let's look at this. Can the economy go up? There's not enough collateral. And if the value of your collateral is going down, you're in serious trouble. Michael Milken, the junk bond dealer, uh, at, a, at a thousand plate uh, uh, dinner, mentioned um, we've got to go out and collateralize the commons. And we've got to find it. You know, resources, of, this is back in the late 80s. This, we've got to find the resources of third world countries. We've got to find the resources of government like education and privatize it or put in our money and take control. So this is what we're up against. Now, let's, I want to, so I want to get, I want you to get to the math problem. I spoke a whole night here or on the seniorage problem. And basically, it was back in Pennsylvania, it took them two years to figure out the interest rate problem that Jerry alluded to. They created 45, in 1723, they created 45,000 uh, pounds, they're in the English system then, and the, they knew they had, they spent 16, well it was 7,500 of those pounds into circulation, and they loaned into circulation the rest at 5% interest. And in their law was, they were just going to burn it all, because they did, the, the rich at the time distrust money, but we needed this money anyhow, and so they said when it's paid back, we'll burn it. It took them two years to figure out that you had the principal plus the interest, you needed that interest to come up from somewhere, and it wasn't in existence. And in their law, the key point is, and these were get back again to the Quakers in Pennsylvania, they wanted everyone to be successful. So in the original law, remember this, this is a crucial distance between this, between public and private consciousness, is the law was made for the, in to loan money to the poor and industrious at an easy interest rate. And it was a partnership between those who made the money and those who borrowed it, and they wanted to make sure everyone could, make, uh, could pay back their loan because that was going to be the social money by which progress was made. The, they learned from the other colonies, and, and, the, and they took new steps to protect and make sure that the poor and industrious could pay back their money. They made shilling notes, shilling and a half notes. They made it small so people could make a lot of transactions among themselves, and they looked. And they learned, they, they threw over through the rich, basically, and their concerns. And they said, you know what? We're not going to throw out this money. We're gonna, we've got to spend it into circulation. So they, in 1726, they passed another law that says, instead of burning the money, we, and they burned, at that point, 6,100 pounds, 110 pounds to be exact. 
And, and uh, they saw that we, it, it's mathematically, as Jerry gave you pointed out, as people through the history of our country figured out, it's, the system doesn't work mathematically. And it's the same problem today, and no one's really listening. That's why Greece is at 50% unemployment for its youth, and Spain is right behind it. And on top of this, there's the, the collateral problem. Milton Friedman called that, actually, wealth creation. If we're going to create by collateral at this point in time with our population in the world, we need one to two more Earths going around the sun. So will we have a double dip? We, it, it's, double dip is we've gone down in a valley, and we're trying to come out of the valley, and they're saying since we're come, working to come out of that valley, it, we're growing. We've turned the corner. When will we get up to where we were? In some analysis, the Fed Reserve is saying we are now up. We're growing past 2008 and 2009. I, I, I don't feel it in the economy. And, they, and the Fed themselves do not understand, and their economists are paid not to understand this issue. <laughs> I, I've been, I've worked with the Federal Reserve just three weeks ago working with their economists and they don't get this, what, what's being explained to you today. Okay, next. The NEED Act then, what's the solution? The NEED Act goes only so far because the idea of what's he's doing, he's doing the first step that's a moral step. So I want to suggest to you perhaps another step, too. He says, one, we have to nationalize the Federal Reserve. Two, we have to stop fractional reserve banking. And, and what that's going to mean is that when the bank loans money, it's loaning its actual customer's money, but it can no longer create it. From the accounting rules now allow them to create it. If they screw up, FDIC backs them up. So I want to tell you that when you put your money in a bank, you need to have, under a new system, you need to have some real serious interest what they're going to do with your money. Do you want it to go for loans for war? Do you want it, or for new planes? Or, you know, what do you want to use your money for or allow them to use it for? <clears throat> the, third, the third part is, is that like the 1726 part. If you stop fractional reserve banking and how, how things work now, the Fed will tell you you'll collapse the economy. And in some sense, they're right. What you have to do is what uh, Pennsylvania did. They spent the money into the economy. Uh, they spent it at, at the rate of 16% originally, but that wasn't enough. And by 1726, they had to spend every bit into their economy, and they even had to create more money. But they went from 1721 when their mayor, Jonathan Dickinson, said, I don't know how we're going to get through the winter. By 1739, the House of Commons of England, the Pennsylvania Assembly, and Ben Franklin and, that I have in 1741, is saying, in every household contentment, because they work with a partnership with how they brought their money, their money into circulation, their new money. And the question, the seniorage question, how I bring it up is, when money is created, and we create it out of nothingness, who gets to spend it first? How does it come into circulation? It's around that central question. You can go back in history and figure all of this out. It's waiting for you. So our language book is how we came into it, and Geraldine worked this out a lot on her own. The question that I'm going to go beyond is our language. Our language is going to a minimum step of what morally corrects the problem. The, the next question for you to think about, though, is do we want to create loans? If, we're, if government has to be active in creating the money and bringing it into circulation, do we need to push further? And should every citizen be able to rent or get so much mortgage money based on their citizenship? And government makes sure they, get, they have the job so they can pay, they can pay it back. I know we like privatization, and we may not want to be pushing uh, socialism in government and in job creation, but the basic, 
the basic notion has to be somewhere going into the future with a sustainable economy and our ecology problems, if the private sector isn't producing the jobs for the common good, then the public sector has to be able to produce those jobs. And it's not inflationary. When you fill, and it's called GDP gap, that's the economic term, when you fill the GDP gap from the unemployment level and the rate of unemployment, and you give people who want jobs, jobs, who are underemployed, you give them more work. For those who are misemployed and you get them to work to their more truer capacities, and, I, and this is where education comes in, that's called filling the GDP gap, and that's not inflationary. <coughs> Even though the, 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 sort of the, po the powers that be are going to say that's inflationary, and they want to go in the op opposite direction, which is austerity. And, and they actually, in this system, mathematically, just helps to collapse the economy. And when you give the money to the rich, you further help collapse the economy, and you really go against what we learned in Pennsylvania, is it's not, you got to bring money out there for the poor and industrious, and it's a partnership when you create that money. That's what we have to learn today. And if we don't do it, we're not going to get, there's no double dip. It's, it's recession, and, it, and, and, and the math isn't there to change it. I would like any of you who are, think regular economics come up with how we're wrong on this. I would like it, because I would like to see some future, but, I'm, but, but the cards aren't there mathematically. I teach math at CPS. It's not there. So outreach. I want to tell you what we've been doing to help educate around uh, the U.S. and the world a little bit. In the U.S., Dennis Kucinich has introduced the bill in the last session of Congress and in the present session of Congress, along with John Conyers from Detroit, and together uh, uh, it's called the NEED Act. And in the NEED Act are those three steps that I gave you before, and I'm suggesting to go further. And the, I, since I was been active since 2005, and I've been a Chicago Teachers Union and active in my union. The Chicago Teachers Union happens to be the first union in the country to endorse the act. And the way I've been doing it is from two years ago, two years ago exactly, I started going to CTU meetings and I, we, I just say, let's have a study group. Here's some information, here's some information. And I worked with them quietly for about a year and three months, just in the background, just feeding them the information. Then, in uh, last fall, things were hitting the crunch. Uh, Arnie Duncan's, you know, in Washington, and Chicago Teachers Union, like all unions, is being squeezed. But because Arnie Duncan and, and, and the personality of Karen Lewis and what's going on in Chicago, we, we became the epicenter in education and the unions for a bit. And I worked with Karen Lewis, and I mean, we were working on the phones through vacations and everything, and I had to make her knowledgeable, and I had to make her inner core team. First of all, I made sure I joined that inner core team, paid my dues, got on the inner core team, worked with them, and then uh, in January, early Jan January 11th, the uh, Chicago Teachers Union Leadership Council uh, endorsed the act. And they were the first. Since then, the International Engineers Union has endorsed the act, um, and there's been publicity as far away as to New Zealand. There's another group, too, that has seen the problem. Young people have come and gathered in London, and it's called positivemoney.uk.org something. And the positive money people, they're made up of a, there's two groups, and I just got to tell you about them. One group are 20-year-olds. I don't think anyone's 30 yet. One guy was 60 who came into the office. And what they're doing is, and they came from the Ukraine, from Slovenia. One guy was from Latin America who was studying in Germany, and he heard about this, and he came into London. And they're in, they're in a, an office no bigger than about two of these tables. 
nine people, nine young people sitting at computers, and they're just pushing out this information, and they've been getting grants, little little bits of little bits of money. They started in you know one guy's bedroom. His name's Ben Dyson, wonderful guy, and totally dedicated. In the last three years, bankers have given up their banking positions, and it was it's like you know Star Wars. And they're going from being part of the empire to coming to, to work with these rebels. And these rebels have been getting interviews. And positive money now has gotten into the main media in, the, uh, in London. Um, so that's the good news. There's an older group called the Brumsgrove Conference. And they're all our age. I wish there were more young ones here. But they're all our age. And they sit back and look at what the young ones. But they, they've been doing it for 20, 30 years. And there was a great industrialist, um, uh, Stewart, John, uh, John, uh, John Gibbs Stewart, and he wrote Fantopia, and he wrote a few books, but he, he made money in the industrial movement, and he started the Bromsgrove Conference in the 90s. And um, they're the old hats. And, um, and they, they're, they sort of help feed the positive money people and uh, give them uh, theoretical and historical experience to give them their inspiration to go forward. So it's a wonderful symbiotic thing. We need, I think we need more of that in this country. But they're working on the education and getting the knowledge. When, when the Occupy movement, it was St. Paul Square in London, they've been very active and they're uh, they have just like nice slogans. It's called positivemoney.org, but the, but the slogan is change money and change the world. And they're and they going on. So there's and it's, they're, they it's just just this week they first got their first mention in the mainstream media. And they and some of these young guys are um, authors on on how to change the Bank of England, the, the equivalent of the Federal Reserve. The, this week, the, the Goethe Institute in Chicago is having three days of meeting on, on can the euro survive. It's this coming Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I don't know if there's space or interest here, but maybe somebody would like to get in on that. It's mostly, uh, I'll, be work, I'll be there and I'll be bringing up this issue as nice as we can. But that's, that's where we are, and uh, we're still pushing forward. Thank you. Speakers are now open to your questions. Uh, I see Karina has her hand up right uh, away. Karina? Jerry, um, a bank, in order for a bank to loan someone $5, they should in fact have $10? $5 to loan the person and $5 in reserves? The bank, you're saying? Yes. The way it works under the current system. In the general application is the banks can create money through the fractional reserve system. But so you're saying that you want the banks to have a 100% reserve, so if they loan out $1, they have to have $1 reserve. Right. And if they loan out $1,000, they also have to have $1,000. They, they, they have to have the money in order to lend it out. All the money that they lend out, they have to have the money so on basically hand. basically all the money they lend out, multiply that by two is what they would, because half of the... Being one town no, no, no. Part would, of it. There would be no. There'd be a division between um, the um, what do you call this kind of the, the the checking and the savings accounts, if, basically. If, there, <coughs> if you have checking accounts or demand accounts versus time accounts, so if your your demand accounts, you cannot loan that money out because people want immediate access to it. If you have time accounts, savings accounts, CD accounts, and by the way, um, demand accounts, checkable accounts in this country now are no greater than 9%. In 1960, they were 60%. Now, your checking account is only 9% of the market. 56% of the market is savings and CDs. Banks borrowing from another, that's another whole other chunk of the market that they're playing with. 
but it's in those time accounts that they can lend from, borrow from those time accounts, those deposits, and re-lend it based on, on the time and the accounting system that FDIC, uh, the uh, uh, controller of the currency, and other people will be setting up, including the FDIC. So, okay, so if we get rid of the fractional reserve system, and Joe walks up to the bank, and Joe says, I need a loan for $1,000, how much money should the bank have in reserves? Should that be another $1,000? No, they they need they need to have the thousand dollars in the time accounts, the savings accounts. In the savings accounts. And they need to have that there in order to lend it. Out. And what Steve was saying was ideally he believes that it should be structured in such a way the the banks themselves where um, when you put your money into a savings account at a bank. That bank, so you're going to be getting, you know, uh, based on the investments that that bank makes from what they loan out, you're going to be getting part of that as interest um, payments to you, just like you do in a savings account now. But um, you'll be able to have some sort of a say in how they're lending that money. Like right now, the banks can lend it to all their favorite little multinational corporations. And um, it, it, you have nothing to do about it. So that's why a lot of what we're coming up against, fracking and all of that, you know, it's like we protest and out our Kazula and nothing happens. It's because the banks are in control, like Glenn said, of the, the whole um, political debate. But what, what Steve was saying was morally that really when you're, when you're putting your money in a bank, in a savings account, that you should have some say because you're going to be sharing in the profits that that bank is going to be making that you should have as a shareholder if you will some say in where they're going to be able to lend the money to or how okay. I just add to that there I want to make a distinction between the bill that's uh, the need act and the positive money act in England in England it's in their law and their in their bill that they they're they're introducing that you have to choose as a customer who how you're gonna who you're gonna support when you give your money to the bank. You're gonna have more influence than that. Whereas in this country right now, the need act leaves it leaves it more ambiguity. There's more ambiguity, so that the FDC, FDIC, and the Monetary Control Board that's created in some of these Federal Reserve agencies that are getting nationalized, that they are gonna come up with a system where. Um, Hopefully, banks can be able to make their loans, and uh, with more money in circulation, filling up the GDP gap, etc., the banks are going to be able to do well, but they're not going to be able to go crazy as they are now. You know, let me say, one of the things we're trying to do, obviously, is to get some people who are interested in this and willing to learn about it, and um, as Stephen didn't mention, but, um, Steven Zarlenka is going to be having uh, a, a course, as it were, through the Occupy um, later, this this month. later this month. So you can look on their calendar, I think, and find out where his cor course is located. Um, to because they're going to do he's going to do a study of his book, um, and so then you'll be you know become much more informed and able to <coughs> do some work like Steve Walsh if you're part of a union or a church group or whatever it is that you're part of. Is that run by the American? Uh, well, Steve, Zar Steven Zarlinga will be the one that's giving the course yeah, yeah, through this. Yeah. Through this. Yeah, yeah. All right, LP. Hi. Um, I have a question. Any one of you or all of you, uh, have you given any thought to the idea that uh, is the fractional reserve banking system as it was designed, was that designed to intentionally continually transfer wealth to the super rich? You know, like they, they didn't make a mistake. I mean, you say it, it constantly leads to uh, foreclosures. You know, ultimately they're constantly transferring wealth from the chain of command. Yeah. 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 Remember, in the Pennsylvania Assembly, is that was the government receiving the interest rate from the loans. In our present system, banks are creating the money every time they make a loan and it's backed up by the FDIC and, and other agencies. And so they're making the interest. And that interest rate, when the Pennsylvania, uh, when the government 
can earn that money instead of the private banks. In Pennsylvania, they used to have a property tax in the 17-teens, and they had a, uh, a poll tax, which was their, like their income tax, you could read it, think of it as. But in 1724, 1725, they could drop those taxes. No income tax, no property tax, and, and uh, the interest rate, government just ran off the interest rate. And I can break that down. They gave so much to the Crown, so much for peace with the Indians. You know, Pennsylvania didn't have a war with the Indians. So you could have a dramatically different system today if you learn to control your senior age. Uh, yeah, can, I, I, can I just, I want to, about Freshers Reserve, I just want to give uh, a response. 1913, right? Right. Well, this, the Freshers, this is the Federal, federal, uh, the federal Reserve. But the Freshers Reserve existed long before. People would put, gold money in their accounts and the bank would issue a gold note. And what, so what happened, at these, there were no demands on that gold because people were passing notes around saying, I own this amount of money in the bank. And the banks found out that they could issue more notes because very rarely did people actually come to get the gold. So they would wind up uh, having somewhere, I remember reading uh, the reference from uh, Blue Books in, in, uh, in England that they had someone in order of uh, uh, three, three, I can't remember, it was three million pounds, and they had notes for claims on that, three million pounds, of 27 million pounds. Uh -huh. So there you have your, your ratio of how much reserve you have versus how much in circulation. So the bank is, everybody is owning the same few uh, uh, little pile of gold, uh, no one's, until somebody tries to go and get it, that's a run, and but then the banks have, collapse. That doesn't have exponential interest growing like the fractional reserve. Does. Well, it's 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 a it's a it's a nine times, and so uh, if the, if there's still claims on on the money. So you're actually getting instead of getting interest on only three million, you're getting interest on twenty seven million. So you are getting substantially more interest from that money by by loaning it out by giving, putting notes on multiple times. Which one? Let's say if you want to buy a house, two hundred thousand dollars. You want to pay cash. You better off. You get a loan and pay cash for the house. Well, that depends on your own situation. Now, you know, I mean, it's, it, you're playing within the system that we've got right now, and it is according to what your situation is. Uh, and there's a whole lot of factors involved. You yeah. save, get a loan, you save money. You have to pay interest. You have to pay interest and it's compound and you look at it, you know, that there's calculators online and you look at it in terms of how much interest you pay over time. So, you know, I mean, there's a bunch of different calculations. How could you put your money? Uh, I've heard of losses. You pay cash. You better off take a loan. Get, get <coughs> let me let me let me answer this a little bit. When the interest rates drop now you can get loans, you know, 4% and less than that. The banks are able to borrow money at a quarter percent. So they're able to make a nice differential. And when they're borrowing it, they can borrow it from the discount window or the, or the, or the LIBOR rate, or in this country it's called the federal funds rate. So they can borrow money on the cheap and, and lend it out. The problem right now, they have, well, we've got a few problems at that moment. But, the question is microeconomics, you know, an individual case. I'm going to answer that now at a macroeconomic level. If you pay cash for your house, you're opting out of the, the you're not playing their game because you've created no new money. If you borrow money, that 200000 for your house, then you're playing their game. And the, the interest that you have to pay on that $200,000 is not in the system. To make the system work today, given the collateral and the mathematical problem we brought up to you, you have to collapse interest rates. And Ben Bernanke understood that based on Milton Friedman and Debbie Schwartz's work in the 1930s, which he studied. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Bernie Connie. It's been suggested that the uh, housing bubble was deliberately engineered to en masse drive the value of houses way down so that those that already have a ton of money could spend little of that money and get these capital assets 
And then over time, when, the, when and if the economy recovers, all of a sudden they have huge capital gains. Could you, could you uh, comment on that speculation? Yeah. yeah, there's a wonderful person, Michael Hudson, who in, in Harper's Magazine about three, four years ago uh, describes that. But in what he states, and we're right in the middle of it right now, it's the, called the capital asset. Your capital asset is your house. Your capital asset stripping phase of the economy. And that's what we're in now. Your capital asset stripping phase of the economy. All right. All right. Janet Miller. Um, this is for anybody, really. You're talking essentially about a mass reform of the capital system. Uh, has, has it occurred to anybody that maybe the capital system is worth saving and there's, dare we mention, mass work, socialism, or, or anything else, or barter, or, or you know, combinations? Or? I think that that was kind of, a, a, really, Glenn and I were talking about this before, but socialism, Charles Walters, who, uh, the late Charles Walters, who founded Acres USA, so I'm interested in um, agriculture, uh, and as it applies to money creation, but um, he, he pointed out that, that all the isms, socialism, capital, capitalism, and, and uh, communism, all of that are still dependent on the same economic system, which is what we have now. The, when you look at the colonies, they had little communes set up, they had the freedom to do that, and that was one of the, um, the, the great benefits that the Jeffersonians, in particular, were so proud of was that you know each of these little communities were able to develop their own kind of um, method for uh, um, uh, helping each other uh, um, prosper within the limits of the, the community. So um, I, I think it really is the wrong place to go if we say, oh well, we're going to destroy capitalism. We want to destroy the mo want to get rid of the monetary system and replace it with one that will work for the great unwashed masses. That's I mean, what we Cuba want. says that their, their um, ultimate goal is to do away with money. Now, whether they're going to do it or... Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's possible. I, there's, that there's, I mean, it's hard enough right now to try to replace um, U.S. Federal Reserve notes with U.S. Treasury notes, interest-free. Yeah. So people can't understand that, uh, you know. And uh, it's a very simple. If you read the Need Act, it's beautifully. It's it would be gradually. Um, it would change over very gradually. There would be the minimal disruptions to the economy, um, and it would provide, I think, less immediate threat to the to the power elite, the ones that are really benefiting. Because there's a lot of those that know when that the system sleep? is problematic. We listened to a fellow from the Federal running. Reserve here a few years ago, and he had to admit when one of you guys was questioning him, kept asking him, he had to admit that, yeah, eventually the system's going to collapse in its own way. It has to. There's no way it can't. Um, All right, Doug Boucher. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> one uh, question, you can probably a answer this in part, but I'm going to ask it anyhow. Uh, can interest on debt be forgiven in part or all without consequences? And how does the FDIC reserve uh, requirement set by uh, Federal Reserve Banks uh, factor into what you've said tonight? There's a there's a question about the uh, uh, the forgiveness of debt. Is are you talking? Forgiveness of of the interest rate, or the interest due on debt. Okay. Can, can we have it done without, in part or all, without something? I, I think that's. I, you know, I don't know about. I don't know. I can't really answer that question. I'm, I'm not really exactly sure how that is. Uh, Stephen, can do your part. All right. Um, there is a wonderful um, Australian economist, Stephen Keane, who is on Counterpoint in England. Uh, um, one of their talk radio or talk TV programs, and he, he made that suggestion. He, he said the system is far enough along and collapsed that there used to be the sense historically, Jubilee, if you go back into the Old Testament, and there's you know a new order coming in with a new king in Babylonia, Egypt, a pharaoh during the Greek city-states, etc. When you had to have interest relief, and we're at one of those points because there's no way out. 
The problem we have with Steve Keen is he's got the right idea, even though if you collapse the interest rates and you forgive interest rates, in two, three years, you're right back into the same system, and you're still basing new money based on the collateral. So the collateral problem we brought up, you might... And then the other point you've got to keep in mind, there's two sides of the ledger. There's the creditor side, and there's the debtor side. So if you forgive interest rates, the creditor side loses out. The, the solution in the NEED Act is consult, considered by, from the 1930s, economists going up, it's considered the elegant solution because it, 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 it gets around that problem. All right, but the second part of my question was in regards to the, uh, the role of the Federal Reserve System setting uh, reserve requirements for the banks. Yeah, let me, let me go to that. In England, there's no reserve requirements. Zero. You don't have to have reserves. You can, a bank is allowed to choose its own reserve requirements. So if it has money in its accounts, it can lend it all out with the prayer that no one comes in the bank for any money. You can do that. Under the need act, if you the, the explanation I gave to the lady, if you have time, if you have time accounts okay. versus checkable accounts, if you have on-demand deposits, the need access, you can't touch that money to the bankers because people want that access to that money. The time account monies, uh, you can go ahead and loan those out, and the need act doesn't give, in, in by law, what the requirements are at that time. They can be made up. So there's some flexibility. They can put in some requirements. England said no, and it's not an it's, and and the uh, Positive Money Act in England uh, doesn't stipulate that. So it's what the customer in England they're saying it, de it depends. It's a relationship between the customer and the banker. But notice in England in this act they're removing that insurance. The key to this and the key to our banking system is government is the borrower of last resort, or the Federal Reserve System, which is not even a true government agency. The, the, um, so the FDIC, when it insures money, and it, you know, too big to fail on the rest of it, that, that guarantees they're going to just flood the system quantitative easing. They can bring money in uh, to, to, make, to make the bankers good and, and to make sure their bonuses are paid. But it's a system, again, that accumulates money towards the 1%. All right, Howard? Um, what is the name of your group? Do you have, uh, I hear various ideas here, but uh, how do you define yourself? An American Monetary Institute. Uh, now, how can I find something in print that defines your, uh, your methodology? Your proposed methodology. Because you can also go to monetary.org. There's a lot of information, and I think that that document is also yeah. in full on that uh, website, monetary.org. Charles? <laughs> yeah, why is it this guy running for president of the United States doesn't use the bank in his neighborhood like I do? <laughs> Yes. Bin Laden's dead. GM's alive. What's the problem? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One of the problems is that there have been no laws broken in this terrible uh, catastrophe, this, uh, un these margins, this collapse, this extortion of money from the public. There's a big problem. When the savings and loan collapsed, there were thousands of people that were uh, arrested and, and taken away, prosecutions. Uh, with this collapse, there's not even been investigation. The president comes out and says nothing was illegal. As it may not have been proper, but it was not illegal. As a follow-up, why not let capitalism do its job and let the central banks go bankrupt? Oh, God. Oh my God. Okay. 
let, let me please let I, me I, give you one more good reason for why you might want that to happen. In, in England, there's a company called Stonyfield, mm -hmm. and they did a documentary on, and it's not the Stonyfield you may be thinking of in terms of uh, yogurt and, and, uh, and in Dominic's or Jules, but it's, it's Stonyfield, and they do um, ham. They, they're one of the they're the, one of the world's biggest suppliers of hams, and they have operations in North Carolina and a few other places. The central banking system in Europe, as the East European countries were coming into the West European banking system, Stonyfield was given a 25 million euro loan to go into Poland and buy out the the. Um, the cooperatives, the large government cooperatives, and use that to, to uh, uh, for concentrated farm operations of putting pigs into great quantities. And they got subsidies on the feed for the pigs, and they and, and laws uh, guarding the pollution and, and the, the concentration of pollution the pigs were producing. Pigs. Uh, produce scat or poop or shit or whatever about eight times the rate that humans do. So go figure. In Wyoming today, there's a pig operation with 800,000 pigs in a concentrated area with, with no real cleansing system. And that amount of fecal matter produced in New York City has eight processing plants to keep it clean, none in Wyoming. People in Poland were getting sick in small towns near these plants, and they produced it, and they're really fighting back. Stonyfield, to protect itself, is fighting back and controls the laws, corporatism and government, that says, if you complain about them, we can send you to prison. Because they can define. And Robert Kennedy Jr. is, is to go to prison in Poland because of Stonyfield, if he goes back to Poland. They could, they could try to prosecute him. But knowing that in mass of what's going on, they, they decided to start operations in Romania and a few other countries. Motion. That's your sense of Actually, I just comment one more thing on that. Uh, Oprah Winfrey was on trial for making disparaging remarks about ground beef in this country. So she was uh, uh, threatened with, uh, she had the money to fight back though. So. This is not unique to Poland. This this happens everywhere. Capitalism always takes care of its own. Okay. Who pays the piper? <laughs> yes, Mo. Uh, Steve, I like your sneaky way of working in the teachers union, and uh, apparently parallel work is being done by the Positive Money Group uh, in London. Uh, but I'm wondering if at some point, maybe this November. Uh, you will go to one or more congressional candidates and say, you'll have my vote if. So my question to you is, what follows the if? And if it's the need, if it's simply support of the NEED Act, could you just explain briefly again what the NEED Act is? I um, need to know. Yeah. <clears throat> Two things. I'm working with my representative, Mike Quigley, and he's promised to meet with me. And um, I've worked with the AFL-CIO and, and the uh, National uh, I want to interrupt you. My point, my point is, if you're in a public meeting with a candidate and you wanted to make this demand public, you know, usually you have to do it in 25 words. What would be your 25 words in a public meeting so that the public, uh, the rest of the voters can understand what you're trying to do? Yeah, well, first I need to tell you, I was this distance away from Paul Krugman, who writes at the New York Times, who, who should be a little bit knowledgeable. He's a mainstream economist, thoughtful on these issues. And I asked him if he knew about Kucinich's introduction of the NEED Act, H.R. 2990. I don't know. I don't keep up with that. That was his answer. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. So then what, we, what can... What can the NEED Act stands for the National Emergency Employment Defense Act. You know how they love, you know, student defense loans? They love to get those words in there. And uh, 
So the American Monetary Act, AMA, got changed to the NEED Act, National Emergency Employment Defense Act. Okay? Now the question is, you can ask your, in 25 words or less, ask your congressman or whoever, have you heard of the NEED Act that has a three-point solution? Nationalize the Federal Reserve, stop fractional reserve banking, or use 100% reserve banking, and to spend money into circulations. So that everyone, if the private sector isn't producing jobs, then the public sector can produce well, the jobs. Also creating private jobs. They, how much, how many trillion? Um, the, the NEED Act puts in, um, it starts with infrastructure jobs first, um, which can't be exported, by the way. So um, rebuilding roads, bridges, um, uh, uh, educational facilities, and all of that. How many, what was it? $4.2 trillion worth of, of jobs to rebuild the infrastructure based on the American Civil Corps of Engineers estimates of what the country needs for its failing infrastructure. Bridges are falling apart, everybody knows this. So that, it, it's, a, it's a system that helps create jobs, it, it has it right in the act, we're gonna create jobs for this, this particular thing to start out with. We're gonna start paying down the federal debt by replacing um, federal, no, federal reserve notes uh, with uh, treasury notes. Uh, we are going to uh, give grants to the states, initial grants to the states, so that they can use them for their own projects. So I put some more uh, power into the local government, and then they'll have interest-free loans um, that can be created um, by the local governments based on a tax that would redeem the, the loans, pay off the principal of the loans over a period of time, so that you know when your little town wants to build a bridge to nowhere, how much it's going to cost, and when it's going to be paid off, and how. So that money, though, the loan money, would be created at the Treasury. So you read the Act, there's several different parts to it that um, uh, help get the money down into the, the local economies and the people um, fairly speedily and through these uh, jobs that will be spread all across the United States. Four point two trillion worth of dollars worth of jobs is a hefty amount of money to start bringing into circulation across the United States to re to do something useful. All right, uh, Russell, Russell Johnson. Yeah, I see the real problem is from going off the gold standards and the uh, going to the federal, Reserve, creating a federal reserve and the FDIC. When someone fails, let them fail like Lehman. Well, under a, a, a under a legitimate uh, banking system, maybe we could have that happen. But Steve wants to correct me uh, before we oh. go any further. So no. it's. The engineers came up with 2.2 trillion, and so that over five years, so the act has about 600 billion per year going uh, being spent, which happens to be right about the stimulus money that uh, Obama got passed in when he uh, the first year of his presidency for stimulus. But we would be saying that stimulus needs to happen every year. And it shouldn't be with interest and pass-through interest going into the financial sector. It should be government money for the people, by the people, working for the people. Kathy Reed, you have a question? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I have one question. Um, I, I, I follow the economy very, very, very closely. And a lot of people out here are talking about the presidential candidates. And I got into the... Uh, a discussion with a couple friends over the weekend and I, I told them, I said, there's something happening in this economy that's going to be hard to really fix. I don't think they got it, but anyway, the thing is, is that I just have a basic question. There's something that the media isn't putting across. What will ha what will an ultimate collapse look like? <laughs> what will an economic meltdown look like? Because I don't think people understand what's going to happen. Because the media doesn't tell us. Did you ever sell apples? I think what a collapse will look like is what Detroit looks like. I've never been to Detroit. Another in 2008. 
shipping across the world. Ships were just docked, and we began to have that. And then there, would, there could have been a worry. And we can go back and forth of how do you keep the pre present system going, you know, pumping life into it. Basically, the economy and the, and the problems we brought up today, we ask you, as even if you were sitting here in the Federal Reserve and you're all economists around the world protecting the system, how do you solve the problems we brought up tonight? You know, we challenge you as economists, come up with the solution. You know, much less think about sustainable economics in the future. Everybody should be taken care of. Part of, part of the money is, is if people are, if we're the generation getting older, why do, you, why do you use it? Why do you keep your young people unemployed? Let them become nurses and doctors to, to help us when we got to get to the hospital. We can have some of our own self-interest in this, too. But the collapse, um, the collapse in some small ways is all around us. Uh, I've got a question. And that is, isn't this a little like mutual banking? Uh, we, we do have some mutual banks uh, where the depositors uh, uh, meet together to determine what, what those uh, there, policies are. Right. There, there is, in the history of this country and in the world, too, and other places, there's a switch over, uh, a turning, uh, and it happens slowly and fast, but I'll mention that. Banking was started around 1815 in the private sector, as I understand it, with what was called building societies. And they started in England and in this, and they went into becoming mutual savings banks. And you can follow the accounting in this. And I, I've done some of this work. I've looked at uh, savings and loans over the course of the 20th century. And they laxed, they changed the accounting rules slowly but steadily so that they can more and more make out loans and have less reserves. So in 1913, the, the Federal Reserve ratio, as this gentleman brought up, was 37.5%. So you had to keep, you could loan out, you got in $100 of anyone's money in any way, you could loan out $66, 66 dollars of that money approximately, and you went on. They, they kept lowering the reserve ratio. And when you lower it, you, uh, you change things dramatically. Okay? But that whole system doesn't work mathematically for the reasons we gave you. And we're not trying to save the system. We need to correct the flaw. It's the, you know, in a Shakespearean sense, it's a tragic flaw, and we're trying to correct it. Oh, uh, what's okay? Yeah, uh, how many in here know who's on their um, mortgage insurance as the beneficiary? Okay, and when you have a mortgage, you can check, and mainly it's the bank. It's absolutely the bank. So they get you, their money first up no matter what happens. But you can change that and put yourself as a beneficiary. Maybe not at the time you get the loan. But um, you can change it. I'll let's see, Doug Beckley. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the NEED Act uh, really doesn't have much of a chance of becoming law. So uh, what do you advise an individual to do to protect himself or to profit from the uh, coming uh, double dip of the recession? The, yeah, the Libertarian Party is pushing commodity money, gold and silver, and uh, putting little, they, they've emulated this and putting little gold dust and silver dust on playing cards and then using it as trade. You can go to a, a commodity money system. There's a wonderful, actually, I have a copy of his book right here. I'll put it up. A wonderful gentleman. It's called Triumph of the Bankers by William Hickson. And I would, it's a wonderful read on somebody who would like commodity money. Steve Zarlenga was into commodity money. He spends the first half of this book going through the last 400 years and why commodity money as a system has to fail. As something becomes more and more precious and more and more scarce for various reasons, because we, you, you, 
you lose it in use. You can go back to Alexander the Great and you know, and how much silver he pulled out of Egypt to start conquering by, and uh, how much was lost in 150 years. So you could, but anyhow, he covers the problem with commodity money and the, and, and the difficulties behind it. We're not finding it at the same rate which your economy grows. And so when you hoard it, you can't, anything you can, well, I'll give you the general rule. The general rule is the following. Anything you can make an investment in, by definition, is a, makes for a lousy money. Okay, I'll just say it again. <clears throat> Anything you can invest in, by definition, makes for a lousy money. Because you don't, you, in an investment, you want it to go up. Money, you want it to be stable for your society. Right, that's, that's what John Taylor was describing in his book. He was kind of saying money is a ticket. Um, that that will allow you to um, exchange exchange items of commerce. It's not a commodity or a thing. Um, but I think you know one of the things about I, we get this a lot that oh the Need Act will never pass. It's kind of def a de defeatist attitude in my opinion. It doesn't matter if it doesn't pass today or tomorrow. They've been we've been fighting for this kind of thing since the country's founding. And unless we get a fire under our rear ends, you and me. It ain't never going to happen. We're, we can't depend on Congress critters. We can't depend on, on uh, you know, whoever. We've got to depend on ourselves to make it happen. We've got to learn why it's important and then how to communicate that to other people. Even if it's, that you're, it's your next door neighbor, it's your city councilman, whoever it is, and in whatever way you can do that or participate. Um, Steve forgot to mention another project that he's kind of trying to get involved in that maybe you might get involved in or you might know somebody. Um, it's a professor from the UFC who's um, uh, uh, conversant with gaming techniques. And can you explain that? Um, actually, U of I. Um, I lived in Alaska, and I would write heritage curriculum. I was, a, I, you know, I have an anthro background, so I've been writing. I wrote for some years third and seventh grade uh, heritage, and uh, for this semester, this last year, I've been only working half time for CPS in schools as a math and science specialist. <coughs> the other half of the time, I've been working studying money and economics, but I'm working with a number of young people and other teachers to create. A K-12 curriculum around money, and one of the uh, things we're working on is how to learn, you know, like Athens versus Sparta. I think I brought up some of those ideas, but we want to put it in. There's a wonderful game called Civilization, and you know, you can go back to the Bronze Age and, and the general, the last gentleman who brought up, you know, what, you know, that need act won't work and whatnot. But if you can go over the history of money and turn it into a game. So there's a number of people out there that we're, we're just uh, trying to get uh, going with uh, putting all of this into a game format. And, uh, that, that's a whole other conversation. We could talk a bit about how do you create okay. games. Ron, okay, Frank Hoffler has the last question. All right. Then we will move to our rebuttals. infamous rebuttal period. Mm -hmm. And which people can... Uh, Self-promote or uh, <laughs> they never give uh, funny stories well, or address the question of the day, whatever. But uh, as you will have to allot the time, that means I'll have to know how many people are going to speak. Uh, I will be asking you about in a minute. First, Frank's question. Yeah, I, I have a background in engineering so, so. science, but I really couldn't grasp this money situation. <laughs> I, um, I think that you, you need to explain it with more detail. It took longer to do it because we have people here talking in this College of Conferences for uh, maybe 30 or 40 years that I have been coming to, and it was this, uh, you know, explanation that never, never in my head coalesced into explain 
Well, well, you've got um, uh, Stephen's Arlene's yeah. course coming up, so you can I, check I, I, that out. I listen to him here, and uh, still, you know, so I... Well, it, you're saying, uh, you know, you might have to have to take some time and, and study the situation. Stephen's Arlene's course is going to be uh, on his book, which is 700-some pages, so it's, gonna, it's not going to take place in an hour. There's a wonderful person who is a scientist. In, I think it was 1917. He won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Jeff, get on the way. Okay, he won. He won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. His name was Frederick Soddy, and he spent years learning it and studying it. You know, for de decades. Wake up. And here he is, a scientist in chemistry, Nobel Prize gives up science and chemistry to study money, and it took him decades. So it's, it's not an easy process. We're giving you a lot of information quickly, and you're right, we haven't even really defined money. But what's your so, so I'm tonight. assuming that everybody here the is the same point, right? Uh, we have defined that. money. When I was here when Zarlanga spoke, and he did define money. And, um, and we sort of, without giving a definition, we sort of quasi-explained it. Next time we talk, I'll, um, I can give you a number of definitions of money by different parties. I've, also, I've got, um, on my website, I have a whole page, what is money, and it's quotes, including from Stephen Zarlanga, from the mixed money case of 1604, which the founders were depending on for part of their concepts of money. Um, and it'll give you a good, if you read through that carefully, um, it should give you a really good handle on what we're talking about. And then I've got some other articles. Somebody asked me over here if I um, have copies of the transcript of what I did tonight. Um, what I'm going to do is clean it up a little bit, and I'll put it on the website, my website, the twofacesofmoney.com, under notable articles, and I think I'll call it Perfect Storm. I've also got ex an explanation of the monetary system. So there's a lot of information on my website that defines money, defines our cur current situation. My book also goes through it in detail of how a new a real system would work and what our current system wor it, it works like. Um, and then there's a lot of information on uh, monetary.org that you, it's, all of this is for free. So you can spend a lot of time there and then get engaged with you know, you can call, there's contact numbers um, for, at monetary.org, you can call um, Steve Walsh, I'm sure. So there's different ways that you can become involved, um, depending on how you want to do it. If you want to go to Stephen Zarlinga's course, um, first, whatever way you want to, just take his book out of the library, whatever. At the end of a speech, a bibliography is not appropriate, what is appropriate is a summation. All right, now we need to know how many of you are going to It's about three minutes, Ron. Four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. I'm glad to see you. We're not exceeding four minutes. So uh, we're going to get a chance to address us before the rebuttals. Uh, the rebuttal by our speaker, uh, Ike, uh, would you have one of you select to rebut the rebuttals? Okay. I, I was a banker for 20 years, and uh, a lot of these things that they discussed tonight uh, were kind of brought back a lot of memories. When I worked for Colonial Bank up uh, on the north side, there was a prediction by the chairman of the board, C. Paul Johnson, that said there would be three banks in the United States sometime in the future. Okay, 
I think there's probably going to be one bank, and it's going to be Chase, because they're popping up like uh, Walgreens and McDonald's all over the city here and all over the nation. Plus, Rockefeller thinks that's what his plan is. Um, before he did that, we got into his banking thing, um, the Rockefellers took over the medical system in uh, 1910. They closed all the medical schools and only reopened the ones that uh, created a pharmacy department so they could get rid of their junk from the refineries. As you know, all of your drugs are made out of benzene and coal tar base. They are all cancerous. And uh, first, I, I do see our friends from Berwyn here. I'd like to welcome them back. Haven't seen them for a while. And uh, nice to see you again. Um, I have an article here from 206, and there's been some updates since then. Um, but this was an update actually from 2002, which I use uh, in, in talking about the genocide of the medical trade that is being perpetrated on the U.S. population. This is only the United States, okay, because the Rockefellers are all over the world, as you know. They are basically, they have their um, banking set up in countries that we have lent money to uh, in, in regards to the economic hitmen, where they uh, lend money to countries, they can't pay off the debt, so we say, okay, we'll take your minerals, will drive up the price of oil and every other uh, commodity that we have out there. Uh, as of 2006, we were killing people at the rate of approximately 800,000 Americans a year. And this study, which was a meticulous study, the startling findings, or findings from this study indicate that conventional medicine is the leading cause of death in the United States. Okay? No other cause of death, guns, uh, falls, blah, 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 equal the number of what we call iatrogenic, that's doctor-induced deaths in the United States. I'm a survivor. You people are survivors. Okay, We've lost some uh, patriots here from the uh, college to doctors over the years very sad. Okay? The cost of this on an annual basis is almost 300 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars in the cost of life when you, when you extrapolate this. Now, today I went to the internet. This sheet here, um, my buddy over here noticed the date on it. It's July 21st, 2012 at 4.03 p.m. I printed off this sheet. This is a three-month study on how doctors kill themselves. Because can you imagine going to medical school for 11 years and finding out that you're a shill for the pharmaceutical company that educated you? And you're going to sit on your fat ass and write prescriptions for the rest of your life, wind up in Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Kuala Lumpur, bring your golf clubs, take your wife, okay, and then you're going to die before you're 55, 57 years old because you're so depressed. This list here shows you exactly how they die. Now this is, like I say, three months. The total here is, is 110 doctors, both male and female, okay, hanging. That's the number one, you know, pretty final when you hang yourself, okay? Uh, 27 male doctors and 7 female doctors, that's a total of 34 doctors, 30% 30 of the 110 hung themselves. <laughs> Cutting, that slit in their throat, I'll be right there. Shooting, 13%. Uh, Drowning, 12%. Asphyxiation and suffocation, 15%. Jumping in front of a vehicle, how about that? 5%. Burning, 2%. Jumping from a height. And then, means not known. Yes. Your current coroner... Yes. Thank you. Your coroner goes to school to find out how somebody kills himself, and they can't find a cure, or can't find a cause when the doctor's dead. So that's 2%.
Let's go. He took that until 11 o'clock. I went to the University of Chicago Business School. I worked in my first national bank in the long-term lending department. I have something to say about the topic, uh, not how doctors kill themselves, but uh, an analysis of uh, the three main points that were made tonight. Nationalizing the Fed. If you have capitalism, you have problems. What Keynes was talking about was that capitalism uh, um, does not create enough demand at various times. That uh, they get around it by having wars where they borrow a lot of money, uh, or uh, you get uh, various uh, social programs, uh, and all this is based on credit. Uh, we have reached a point now that it's not going to work, that uh, you have a crisis because uh, <coughs> of the enormous debt that has been created uh, in, this, uh, in this country. Some of the writers are saying that the uh, total debt is six or seven times our uh, GDP, which is $15 uh, trillion. Uh, and, um, and some, uh, the reason, only thing that's supporting it is that Europe's in worse shape and they're uh, buying treasuries. If it weren't for that, you'd have a collapse of the system, okay? So uh, <clears throat> we're at a very dangerous point in our history. You look back at the last 50 years supported by debt, that's over. And you have big problems, okay? <clears throat> The Federal Reserve, they want to get rid of it, okay? Um, I just want to point out that the man of the year last year was Bernanke. If you didn't have the Federal Reserve, you would have the same situation you have in Europe. You want to get rid of the Federal Reserve, now is not the time to monkey around with anything. And God bless you, you have somebody educated and brilliant like Bernanke running the thing, or um, the unemployment rate that would be 8.2 uh, or 14 percent would be triple that, okay? You don't want to monkey around now, you, and uh, the Federal Reserve is the one that creates money. My God, that's terrible, create money. But if they weren't doing that, uh, you would have a disaster, okay? The, uh, the problem is that um, we're at a point at which that system is no longer uh, going to be uh, viable. Bernanke's assuring us that he has methods that will get us over this hump. And uh, so these people who speak from ignorance, they want to get rid of the Federal Reserve. That's the dumbest damn thing to do right now. They have to have something to replace it, and they don't have anything to replace it, number one. Number two, they want to stop the fractional reserve system. I, when you go to the bank for a loan, they got to have the money. And the way they do that is a fractional reserve system. That they, they borrow, uh, they're able to lend 97% and only keep 4%, and they do that time after time, and it creates a good uh, amount of, of money, so when you go to the bank, you get a loan, okay? These people speak from ignorance that they don't understand uh, how the system works. Okay. They read it, but it doesn't go in the head, okay? And they your have time to is up. It with. Very shortly, number three. Uh, your time, your time uh, is up. Uh, 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 one minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, to hear number three. Same way. The knife cuts both ways. I know. Hello, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Andy Anderson, and I give speeches and presentations to various places on blacked out subjects, things that you can get fired for writing about in the United States. In a democracy, you know, the first step 
I, incidentally, I think the, the presentation was great tonight. This was a, as far as I can tell, a very well done reality based presentation. <laughs> as opposed to a fantasy-based presentation like what we had last week. Uh, build more nukes everywhere and it'll solve the global warming problem. Well, that's true. <laughs> it, as I said, in a democracy, the first step is the moral recognition. You have to sit, uh, recognize that something is wrong and it's up to us to fix it. We can't count on our politicians to do it. We have to get involved. Knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth from Galileo on forward. Galileo was a classic example of that. He published the truth of uh, the Earth revolving around the sun, and he was arrested for it. But people came along behind him, said he was right. It took the Catholic Church 300 years to apologize, but they finally did. Our job and our responsibility, if we care about the future of our children and grandchildren, is to face reality and work towards solutions on a wide variety of problems right now. In, in uh, response to one person that said there's understanding um, problems. You don't have to understand the atomic theory of gravity, the weak and strong pull between atoms and molecules and everything else to be able to understand that you can't survive a leap off a thousand foot cliff without a parachute, right? You don't have to understand how electrons move and wires and everything to be able to use electricity in modern appliances like computers. A lot of us don't understand the inner workings of a cell phone, but we all have them. We work with them. You don't have to you know, understand something to be able to recognize that we need to support the people that do understand it and that are trying to make a difference. As I said, uh, I've got a minute and a half left. Step one is just simply open your mind, forget pre-existing thoughts and uh, prejudices, and face the reality that's pouring in on us on all sides. The middle class in America is under solid attack. We're, we're in a class war, and the rich people have almost won. We have very little time left to turn this around before voting in America isn't going to matter, because they are passing laws uh, to prevent people without the proper papers. That's mostly for middle class uh, or Democrats. They won't be able to permit to vote. Step number two, get a copy of Censored News that comes out every year. It gives you the top 25 blacked out stories of the year and it teaches people how our media runs coordinated blackouts. Americans live in a bubble of ignorance on certain subjects that are common knowledge and widely understood by people all over the world. <coughs> Censored news gives you the ability to learn and how to discern and discriminate between, distinguish between reality and cribs. Cribs is what we get from the major media. Cribs is a short term for criminally insane bullshit. Cribs. We get 10,000 minutes of cribs out of Rush Limbaugh for every minute of truth, every day. And that's, there you can make a whole list of things all right, like that. All right, all yeah. right, So, uh, yeah. get a copy of Censor News, or it's, uh, one last thing, we will auction off, or we're going to give away four books on blacked out subjects sure. on August 18th. All so right. if anybody wants a free book, there's going to be four good right. books available. All right. Thanks. All right. They come with no ideals and opinions. They came with facts and they had some numbers and they had some history and bibliographical information to back them up. Now, they mentioned uh, one of the speakers uh, mentioned that the key word here is creating something out of nothing. And he mentioned that. And why would somebody want to create something out of nothing? Because he don't, she don't get something good. Yeah. Now, when they had to put the country together, they had all kinds of people, the John Jays and the Madisons and the Hamptons and 
uh, the, the guy that made beer and stuff, the name of it, had Samus Adam. Uh, yeah. <laughs> had these brilliant folks meeting together to put together a country. And they put it together by writing out how this be done and that be done, what a pile and so forth and so on. If you're going to have uh, thank you, sugar. a baseball game, you can't play it on a basketball game. Have more water. <laughs> and if you're going to have a game that you call baseball, this has to be some kind of definition. And it has to be formalized. Each base is a certain distance apart. Now, if you go give the Federal Reserve and the few in Wall Street the power, and you didn't give it to them, they bought it. <coughs> ask the senator, ask the senator, ask the regulator. They bought you. But they did this after they take it over the country. Now, if you want to solve this problem, you're going to have to take your country back. You do not own shit. They tell you you can vote, talk to your senator, talk to your representative. The guy that run the fucking world that already talked to him yeah. with this bankroll. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> y'all, long-legged blood, whatever it was, people had already talked to. Now, I don't understand how people, I'm an atheist. I can kind of almost understand somebody want to pick up something behind the goddamn flower. But how are you going to look around and pick out some men and, and people and claim that they're going to do the right goddamn thing when you then gave them the freedom to, what they, to do what the hell they want to do? And if anybody got the freedom, he's going to do what he wants to do. And if he can create money out of nothing, that's what he's going to do. Yep. <laughs> On those days when our business is bad, I think I'll buy a lottery ticket. This is like that. Because uh, things are bad, so guys like you can do this thing. I don't, I don't think you made a good presentation. I don't think you made a point. But uh, that is your bag. The problem we are facing is there are three billion more people who were not eating bread and butter yesterday. Just 50 years back, they are having it. And resources hasn't increased that much. Second thing, world has grown big in a complexity and a bigness. And our system, our education, our understanding is not there. And uh, it is going to take a time for us to understand, and the science is run away. Two years back, uh, you can reach only so many million people. Today, a people can reach few billion people. And so, concentration of power. It's tremendously increased. And so there is going to be inequality there. We need a leadership in this country. Unfortunately, Barack Obama failed to do so. He had the opportunity to do. He did not. Unless we have a strong leader, lots of problems will not solve. I think Bernard K. is a good guy, smart guy, and he answered, he answered pretty well all the questions put by Congress and Senate during last hearing. And he said, hey, look, if you don't like what I'm doing, why don't you fix the problem? Then I don't have to do it. Congress, Congress your elected representative, Senate and President can solve the problem. The Reserve Bank don't have to do anything. Okay, the leader bank can do whatever you want, you know. But these people are not doing, so he's trying to hold on the dam so their water doesn't burst. There are problems all over the world, and they are not going to get solved by gimmicks. They are going to be very...
the financial system is very complex, very, very complex. You know, and with so many powerful countries, so many smart countries, so many big countries, so many big industries, industries require billions of dollars to start. It's not going to be that easy for people to come out with the idea and say, hey, come on, accept this thing. You, you could have, you guys could have presented a better way by focusing instead of going from Jefferson to England to this place to that place instead of focusing on what you are trying to say. But you didn't do it. How many, how many of you guys, I mean, don't like American system? How many don't like rich hand? Okay? It's a, it's a still goddamn good system. What? And still 80, 80, 85 percent, 90 percent people have a job, you know, and when, when iPhone or when Apple comes out with something, there are three blocks long lines from the stores. What are you talking about? They are willing to pay the money, which are huge money. Come on, you know. And, 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 and downtown, Chicago, downtown Chicago prices are going up. The billions of dollars worth of apartments and condos. Yeah. I'm Michael Foley. I want to talk about something a little different. Remember, I'm, I'm a doomsday guy. Something happened in something happened in Bulgaria on Wednesday. I heard once late Wednesday night. I heard on the news a story about something happened in Bulgaria. And that's the only time I heard it on the news this country. On Thursday, I looked on the internet. There were seven people killed and 32 people wounded. A bunch of tourists were getting off a plane in, at an airport in Bulgaria, and they went to get on a tourist bus. And they got on the tourist bus, and somebody, some suicide bomber, it was said, detonated a bomb, killed seven people, wounded 32. These tourists were young people who had recently graduated from high school. They were Israelis. They were on vacation in Bulgaria, and the Israeli government claimed that the Iranians did it. So anyway, here we have a bunch of Israeli young people getting killed and wounded in Bulgaria. May or may not have been done by the Iranians. And I don't mean to sound nonchalant or sarcastic or uncaring, but really, it was a nothing story here in the United States. And I'm not ragging the media, and I'm not ragging people in this country for being uncaring. Good. Yesterday there was a mass murder and wounding in Colorado. That's all over the TV and the news. It's because it happened in this country. The point I'm trying to make is mass murder is common. It doesn't happen every day, but it happens a lot. And we're just callous to it, uncaring. I'm not I mean uncaring about it, meaning uncaring, but hey, it's just another mass murder. This thing that happened in Colorado, I figure Monday and Tuesday, that's going to be the last you're going to hear about it on the news, because there's other stuff on the news, and the Olympics start on Friday, six days from right now. And last Saturday, I got up here and I said that I believe that somebody is going to detonate an atom bomb at the Olympics. The Olympics are being held in London, England, which is the headquarters of the British Empire. And as far as somebody detonating an atom bomb in the headquarters of the British Empire, if that happens, well, that's just the kind of world we live in right now. There's been other mass political heinous acts committed at the Olympics. If somebody's got an agenda they want to push, or somebody wants worldwide attention, you got to do something big. Killing seven people and wounding 32 people don't get you nothing as far as worldwide attention. It got one report on the news here for one night in Chicago. And if somebody wants worldwide attention and a big spotlight for a long time, you've got to do something big. And that's why I figure, well, an atom bomb, why not? You can put an atom bomb on a truck in Pakistan and drive it to London. You don't even have to steal a plane or pack it up and put it on a plane or nothing. You can drive an atom bomb to London in a truck. 
There might be an atom bomb and ones that are ready, just waiting for the right time whenever the people want to blow it. I got no secret sources of information. All I'm doing is looking around at the world I live in and thinking about what might happen. And believe me, if I can think up some demon thing like that, millions of people who hate the British Empire can think up some demon thing like that. And they got atom bombs. That's all I'll shut up now. Thank you. How many here are familiar with the term the greatest generation? Tom Brokaw, yeah, he wrote a book about the, the heroes of uh, 12 or 15 million of uh, World War II. Well, I come to you as a representative of that greatest re uh, generation. I'm only 80, but I was in the platoon that operated at Firewall in Glenwood. And what we were doing was collecting scrap, selling war stamps from door to door. And one of my greatest sacrifices was when I uh, uh, got past the age of makers, the long pants I got didn't have cuffs on them. <gasps> that was because of the OPA, Office of Price Administration. But, uh, anyhow. Um, on, de on December the 7th, 1941, well, the reason I mentioned being a member of the Greatest Generation, what I was doing, what my playmates were doing, was part of this vast national effort, which had everyone's support, even the budget balances, even guys like Senator Bora, who had said positive things about Hitler. Well, on December the 7th, when the attack came, unemployment was 10%. Does anyone know what it was on December the 7th, 1942? Zero. Effectively, it was 1.5%, people changing jobs. <clears throat> it was financed largely by the people. Um, Wall Street financing went down, the sale of war bonds went up. I was selling war stamps door to door. When you got 1875 of war stamps in your booklet, you got it. You could get a $25 bond. I'm wrapping myself in the flag because that's the smart thing to do politically, and I think you guys can do it too. You can use the example of what was done in World War II, and I, if I were you, I would refer to the greatest generation, and you're learning something from what the greatest generation accomplished. We gave up the production of cars, we gave up the production of refrigerators, and yet we were making a lot of money. We took the extra money that we were making, and it was extra compared to what we've been making in the Depression, we bought war bonds. And then what was left over from that, we went out into nightlife. The nightlife in Chicago got greater in 42 to uh, 45 than it had been in the jazz age. That is, uh, 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 Danny Thomas got his start as a, a comedian in a night club with uh, uh, Montrose and Sheridan. By 1944, the diet of the American people was the best it had ever been. Yeah, we gave up a lot of things we were willing to. We had a purpose. Admiral Yamamoto had provided it very conveniently on December the 7th. But he said something smart on December the 8th. He said, does anyone know what Admiral Yamamoto said? We have awakened a sleeping giant. I mean, we've awakened a sleeping giant. That's what I think you guys are trying to do. And I'm just suggesting uh, that you give it a little red, white, and blue coloring. Thank you. <laughs> What I'm going to try to do here is to do some justice to a few questions that a few folks asked. Hello. Um, first, to the woman's question about collapse. In the back there with the hat. Um, the short answer, ma'am, is three weeks ago there was some sort of storm. I forget what the Spanish word is. Oh, yeah, right. That slaughtered a whole bunch of the East Coast and knocked folks' power out for weeks. 
you can start with that. But the trouble is, if you get that kind of stuff, for whatever reason, on a worldwide basis, you can have a whole bunch of Fukushima's. Because as I understand it, you know, I don't know where Frank is, if you can clarify this sort of thing, um, if you run out of, if you don't have electricity going into the plant, and you don't, and you can't get the diesel <coughs> fuel to go into the plant, the plants can melt down, right? Right? Okay. So, and if that, you know, if that happens, well, then you've got a whole hemisphere, I suppose, irradiated. So that's those are your, that gives you some idea of what collapse looks like, anyway. And the kind of thing you can do for starters to try to protect yourself against that stuff. Um, you can go on the web and you can buy a battery-powered fan, or with less, or a battery-powered air conditioner. It's a little thing and it doesn't keep. It doesn't go for hours and hours. But you can buy that sort of thing for twenty bucks. And I'm buying stuff like that. I'm going to continue to buy stuff like that because one of these days the grid is that what happened out there. It's coming to a, a hood near you. It's just a matter of time. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that's that's collapsing. Now, with respect to Frank's question about money, and I'll end up sort of tying it in with Doug's question about investments, because they relate in their way. In whatever time I have left, I'll try to do justice. Money is basically two things, or historically it's been two things wrapped up together. Namely, a medium of exchange on the one hand, and a store of value on the other. Now. Doug's question, the answer to Doug's question had a quote from I forget who, to the effect of that you don't want your investment to be <coughs> in the same place as your medium of exchange. All right. And that, in, in large measure, that's right. And the folks I most respect, what they say is that what ought to happen is what these guys want, more or less. All right. You know, they can live with what these guys want, but with one additional feature. Namely, that the ultimate store of value, namely gold, is treated in a decisively different way than ever before, with one simple law. The law says that if you lend somebody an ounce of gold, you ain't got no access to the courts to get it back. And they have a line of argument, which I don't have time to do justice here, which says that if you stop lending of gold, that will restore gold or make gold the premier store of value because the gold market won't be rigged by all the lending and pseudo lending that's going on, to make a long story short. And then you'll have your two things neatly sorted apart. You'll have your store of value on the one hand, and you'll have your media of exchange that these guys are going to print up on the other hand. And the two don't mess with each other, and they do their separate jobs without getting into each other. And so, uh, the answer is don't think of gold as money. Think of gold as the ultimate store of value and put your money there. And while you're at it, buy some battery-operated fans and maybe buy yourself a bulletproof blanket and buy yourself, I, 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 got, I got a stretcher, a folding stretcher for a hundred bucks, all right? Now, if, if things, if the Industrial Revolution unravels because we're running out of oil, they ain't going to be making them stretchers. No, no. And other stuff like that. No, no. Okay. Uh, I thank the presenters for their fine job of collectively presenting their topic tonight. Uh, second dip, uh, economic predictions. Uh, I just want to make a few comments. Uh, during the uh, question period, uh, I heard someone say, let the banks fail. And I just want to remind you that uh, they did fail uh, in, 19, uh, in the first depression in the, tw in the 20th century, between 1929 and 33. Uh, for those of you that uh, had a family a member alive at that time. Uh, you may have heard about a run on banks. The, there was no FDIC at that time. People ran in. They, they panicked. Remember the word panic? And they cleared out the accounts. And then if you were the last person in after 2 o'clock and the bank didn't have any more money, you were out of luck. 
big, that, that was it. And uh, you get that, and it, it's a wonderful life in that sense. Uh, so at any rate, uh, Roosevelt declared a bank holiday, and in 1934, I believe it was, he uh, set up the FDIC in order to protect people's uh, loans. We still have that system in place today. But of course, it's under a lot of stress. So I guess the, uh, ins the insurance money isn't quite sufficient, but they're trying their best to, to keep it uh, where it's at without raising rates. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I want to remind you that uh, in the 80s, uh, we were talking about how nice it was to have a, a, for people to have votes on uh, the savings and loan. But uh, under Reagan, uh, he uh, re reduced the uh, reserve, uh, regulatory controls for savings and loans. And as you recall, at that time, uh, all the loans <coughs> accounts of uh, the savings and loan were, what, guaranteed by the U.S. government. And guess what happened? You know, the, there were abuses within the savings and loan, and guess who had to pay for it the, for three or four years? The U.S. taxpayers had to kick in the extra money to cover uh, the fallout from that debacle. So in a way, you know, you have to be careful when you to talk about getting rid of government regulations. So that was a case in point that it didn't work out well. Now how do we get into the current uh, situation? Well there was derivatives, uh, there was a lot of corporate and bank read. Uh, remember Enron? Uh, they had a lot of money uh, set aside for employees and the next day it was zero. <coughs> then we had a guy by the name of Madoff who uh, conned people into investing and then uh, it was a Ponzi screen, uh, scheme and there wasn't anything left. And then uh, regarding the, the bankers, you know, they had a field day with these derivatives. They would, uh, for those who don't know derivatives, uh, you took the principal and you sold it to one person and another, you took the interest on the, on the mortgage and you sent it to another person and the whole thing got divided up and everyone thought it was great until people started to lose jobs and couldn't make the payments on their mortgages. And then they were, uh, the, Mortgages then became unsecured, and you know the rest of the story, how the government had to bail us out. We're also facing problems with the population. Uh, we have a, great, a graying senior population, which is the largest part of our population growing. And that's namely the baby boomers, about 70 million of us. I'm in there. I'm in the fourth wave. That covers the years 1946 to 1964. And I feel in a way that we're going to be in this economic rut until about 2035. That reason why I picked that is that's when the last baby boomer is born at 75 and monetary, Time. money supply, and Time. fiscal policy Time. will Time. govern Time. recovery. I, I, I really want to clear the air. I never said that Andy was a liar. <laughs> what I said was that Andy is translating information that is wrong, misplaced, wrong, totally, absolutely not founded on science. Uh, what he's praying into the issue of AIDS is totally wrong, and I, I suppose that he believed what he's doing, and that's why I couldn't say that he's lying. He's translated something that he accepts as true. So we have to be very careful into what we do, say, and what we interpret. And so Andy, I don't know for what reason he get upset if he said that I'm lying. At least I said that he was lying, and I never said that. Uh, as far as to what's happening to the workers in the world, and I was a worker all my life, Every time that you go and work for one of these corporations, you are being fucked. The first day that you start working in there, you are getting fucked. Why? Because the products, the product of your productivity, your, your ideas or the things that you make with your hands, they are sold for a profit. But you don't participate in that profit. They pay you the minimum that they could pay you so you barely survive. And through the years, this have turned into a nightmare. 
the industrial revolution, starting with the exploitation of fossil fuels, I think it promised, or the civilization believed that it was a promise of plenty, of health, of, of abundance, and less war. And that was a false promise. It couldn't be fulfilled. It will never be fulfilled. So uh, we have to somehow grow up out of that illusion. We have to grow up not only uh, uh, in, in, in actual physical way, but also emotionally. We have to grow up about that promise of, of, of that this technology this, this is going to give you candy. Uh, it's, it's similar to what we need to grow out of religion, out of faith in that papa that is going up there and is watching you and is going to give you a, a good afterlife and virgins if you behave or not, you know. So we have to grow up and uh, it's no time, no time. We are, we are really, really stretching the limits of the liability of the planet, and uh, there are very few years now to reverse course, and I don't think we are going to. Well, I'd like to thank our speakers for an interesting presentation, thought-provoking, study-provoking. I've never really understood our money system uh, very well. I did uh, the same business school that Howard went to, but I managed to slither through without ever taking a course in money and banking. So uh, I'm still a novice in this area. Uh, I want to learn more. However, I think that, uh, and I think they made some good points, however, I think that the problem we're in today has less to do with a bad uh, monetary system, which maybe does need some reform, but it has, it's a demand recession. Uh, the reason that businesses uh, are not doing well and not hiring is because there's not demand for their products. The reason there's less demand, or less demand for their products, the reason there's less demand for their products is because uh, a lot of people are unemployed and don't have money. The people who are working aren't spending their money because they're scared to spend it. They don't know where they're going to be. And we have to get out of that, out of that whole uh, situation because that is a downward spiral that can keep going down and down and down uh, and get worse and worse and worse. And related to this, uh, debt is a problem, uh, and both public and private debt, which is out of control. But inactivity caused by this downward spiral is, is really worse uh, in real terms. Uh, inequality and maldistribution of income is related to this problem and also has to be solved in some way or another with a more progressive income tax, perhaps as Rob Burns suggested to us here, a one-time uh, net worth tax would help uh, in this area as well. Uh, with regard to Jeff's uh, plans to uh, protect himself uh, by buying battery-operated fans. Well, the batteries are going to run out at some point pretty quickly. And, and uh, uh, there are some other things. I don't know what he's going to, with that stretcher, if the hospitals aren't operating, I don't know where he's going to take anybody, but the, uh, he can tell us that later. My friend Tom White, who some of you may remember, used to come here to the college, used to drive around with a trunk full of of survival gear, you know, cooking gear and tent, and pup tents and stuff like this. And he said when the collapse comes, which he believed in, and I'm not so sure he's wrong or, or and there, that Jeff is wrong, but there's going to be a collapse. Uh, uh, he was going to go up to the Northwoods and survive that way. And I said, you know, Tom, you and you and hundreds of thousands of people are going to try and do that, and there are not enough rabbits up there to feed you all, so uh, you'd be a problem. What I said about uh, metal, having having a good metal uh, for the collapse is that uh, not gold, but uh, lead with the proper delivery device. But that also will only get you so far. If nobody's making electricity, nobody's growing food, uh, you know, even if you can shoot the guy, the guy doesn't have any of it for you to take, doesn't do much good. So it's been just a very heartwarming evening. Thanks. <laughs> There's an observation that there's only two people in the world who understand money, and they disagree. 
Uh, I think tonight you had a keynote, but it kind of bears out that observation. I think the, you know, I, I have my views about money, but I think the underlying problem is that the human psychological uh, makeup evolved in a non-monetary economy, a hunter-gatherer economy, but you didn't need money, and uh, uh, which, which could fulfill that Marxist ideal from each according to his ability to each according to his need, except there wasn't that much ability you know, how to gather a band there isn't that much need or much ability to, to come from anyway. But <coughs> presentation and that was kind of reminiscent of and it's more sophisticated, but it's still kind of reminiscent of what Hey, Boston used to say for 20 some years that banks create money out of nothing. When they never create the interest, therefore money is already short. With a flick of the pen, the banks own the world. Well, I, I, I tried to get him to discuss this any number of times. I have to confess failure. It just, I mean, I, I did say once that. He had kind of he had sort of his religion, is that Congress is God, uh, interest free, debt free money is sanctifying grace, for and foreclosure is hell. But I think there's a lot worse things in this world than foreclosure. Anyway. Uh, I think the emphasis tonight is uh, talking about mostly about paying interest, which is money that's created out of nothing. I mean, it, it, it's not something to blow off, but I think the far greater problem is seniorage of a depreciating currency. And I'm not a Keynesian by any stretch of the imagination. I don't want to cite Keynes as, a as an authority. But in the economic consequences of the peace, which he wrote in 1919, he said that, well, he gave a very elegant description of the harm that Signorage does in transferring from one set of uh, property owners to another. And uh, I think he pretty well stated the situation you know, you, you know, the whole idea of redistribution of wealth is to take from the poor, take from the rich and give to the poor. Well, I think this passage of Keynes makes it fairly clear that you're taking from everybody and giving to the rich. And that's the, that is where the distribution of wealth comes from. It's not from a free market. And as far as the constitutional issues are concerned, the constitutional term for creating fiat money, for printing money, is not emitting, is emitting bills of credit, which is not in the enumerated powers of Congress. Uh, there was a, a, an attempt to, uh, in the Constitutional Convention to make this. It was rejected with such uh, comments as uh, it would be as long as the beast of a revelation. And I'd better reject the whole plan than to include the three words, emit bills. But, it's, but coining money and emitting bills are two different things. Are you been well, about five minutes now? Wrap it up. Well, anyway, 
four minutes is, you know, four minute rebuttal is not enough for anywhere enough for what I have to say. And I think some other people could have used more time too. You should have. Some but I do have my. <laughs> It's 11 o'clock. I'm sorry, man. It's 11. I do have my uh, pre-prepared rebuttals on the internet at Beyond Bowl. Uh, Beyond. Excuse me, I can't even remember the either. But, uh, you know, I'm going to have to print up some copies of it one of these days for some of you guys. Maybe we may be more appreciative of a little bit that one. Well, the time is 11 o'clock. We're stretching it. Uh, but please. Karl Marx uh, wrote that uh, the history of the evolution of the economic system, starting out with hunter gatherers, moving into uh, Villages, moving into uh, city states, moving into kingdoms, moving into uh, there's tribal groups, uh, industrial groups. And he had an idea that this was all a linear progression. Of course, he was a European. All those things is, exist at the same time, they all exist today. Okay? And what makes everything so hard is when you write rules, when you have some people living as villages right in the middle of Chicago. And you have other people living as tribes throughout the world. And you have other people living as industrials. Okay? Makes it very hard to write rules because each of these different people look at the same rule and bend it to their, or game it to their own view of the world. Human nature. Um, the um, Greece, okay? After the war, Second World War, Greece was very poor. Motor vehicle department starts, one person in it, no need, no need for more than one. Things are getting better. But also there's like this person somewhere who says to this other person, they're in a, in, they're in a couple, you have to get our father, son, uncle, etc., a job. All right? This is happening all over the country. All right? So then what happens? The economy improves a little bit. And the guy comes home and says to his wife, in this case, there's a job. You have to get it. They get it. Two. This happens two at motor vehicles. This is very good. Lines are shorter. Then you get, it happens again, though. Three at motor vehicles. Okay? Three is actually perfect because they cover each other. They take staggered lunches. Someone goes on vacation. There's still two people. Three is perfect. But it happens again. There's four, then five, then six. Then what happens when there's six people in the motor vehicle department that has worked for three? Nobody wants to be the fool who's working. Nobody works. It's just human nature. Why should I work when that idiot comes here late, leaves early, spends all day reading magazines, and makes the same money I do? Why should I work? Okay. That's it's just human nature. Then what happened to Greece? You get them, they join the euro, interest rates fall from 14 or 16 percent because the Greek bankers knew these were Greek people and didn't know how to handle credit. And suddenly they join the euro and they go to the Greek banker and the Greek banker says to, you know, Nicholas, you look like a German today. I don't know what it is, but you look German. How much money do you need? Interest rates are 5%. My God, according to your cash flow, you can afford this. What do you want? Here it is. Okay? And what happened to Greece was like an explosion of credit that they didn't know how to handle. What happened to us is the same thing. What happened to Spain is very similar. Um, the thing about your taking money and trying to get rid of the fractional reserve Sounds like you're taking money and trying to make it hard. Trying to make it like into a limited commodity. And I don't see how that's any better. Um, credit. About four years ago, I didn't understand what was going on with the financial system. It had anything to do with me because I was living in the real economy. And then I'm going into a store and there's a bag, there's a sign on the store that says 10 pounds of rice. That was four minutes? Wow. Okay.
unfortunately, I'm only going to be about 30 seconds. Whoa! Whoa. Oh, that's good. The whole reason your methodology will not work is because we live in what we call a globalized economy. As soon as you shut down the fractional reserve system, as soon as you nationalize the banks in the United States, Mr. Chase at Chase Manhattan is going to withdraw all the money out of his holdings here in the U.S., transfer them over to Zurich, or that guy in uh, Colorado will transfer his wealth overseas, and what you will really see then is the collapse of our financial system on a massive scale. Pass the need act and watch the collapse happen. He should hire you, man. You got it all set up. Uh, I was reading. Microphone. I was reading an interview with um, a woman who is the uh, economic minister of Iceland. She's a former math teacher. That's how they do things in Iceland. People get elected. She didn't even realize she was elected. They're not professional politicians. And Iceland used to be a really great country. Maybe it still is. I was only there once in 72, because they didn't necessarily follow the world's trends. And so they did things like they don't have, a, they, they don't have an armed forces, they had practically no crime, which they still practically have no crime. But somewhere in the last 30 years, they decided they wanted to be big economic powers. They invited businesses to invest completely on margin. They didn't have any money to invest. And they just wanted to attract businesses. At least that's what it looks like when in my subscription to um, Iceland today. And uh, they collapsed a couple of years ago, like the whole world did. If, you, if you've seen the, the film Inside Job, they start with the collapse of Iceland. I don't know if Iceland was really that significant or that was just as interesting. I didn't figure that out. But anyway, they collapsed and they were in pretty bad shape and still are. And what this uh, woman said, well, you know, now we really have to practice austerity. She's a they're social democrat. That's the party that kind of rules. They're a little bit left of our democratic party, but they're not. They're still capitalist. She says, what we have to do now is practice austerity. So there isn't money for everything. So the first thing we have to do is just make sure that the poorest people and the people who need social services the most get theirs first. Then we worry about the others. Speakers get the last word. All right. Speakers get the last word. We want. Speakers get the last word. If you want to. One point seven. Come on. Speakers get the last word. They're wanting me not to go through all my notes. Right. I, I wrote down religiously because I talk fast. There are a lot of great comments. One in a row. First. Yeah, first about. <laughs> First about the um, Bernanke, I think that needs to be responded to. I like Bernanke a lot too, and I think he's a great thinker and he has a great understanding. But let's let's look at let's look at the, the problem in terms of the facts there. Remember in November two thousand and ten, right the day before the election, uh, the midterm election then, he said the Fed's going to buy $600 billion in Treasury bonds. And what he's doing is quant it's quantitative easing. The, what, how it could work is the Treasury prints out these IOU notes called securities or bonds. We'll call them bonds right now, 10-year notes. And, um, and they go into the market. And the banks buy them, get, get first uh, chance in whoever else, uh, third world countries or other world countries uh, can buy them too. The Fed then says it's going to buy them. And there's 19 sec uh, secured dealers at the New York desk at the Fed that sells them to the Treasury, all $600 billion. And when it buys these bonds, these IOUs, it, through the Fed wire, put $600 billion of cash, new money, into the banking system. And that's called the money base, it's called high-powered money, it's how, the, it's how money begins in our system today. 
And then if the Fed makes profits, the interest rate off of it, it returns by law its profits to the federal government. So, and that is the idea of seniorage, because that money came from nowhere out of nothing. And the seniorage, the profits that they had, go to the government. You would think the system works very well then, but there's inefficiencies in the system. And, and basically, with the NEED Act, if you don't have to borrow the money to begin with, or pass out bonds or these IOU notes, but the government itself can create the money, it then doesn't have to worry about interest rates. And that's the key point, and that's how come in England they call it positive money. When people earn the money, and then lots of jobs are created, you're not collapsing the economy or making less money available. When a lot of people are able to earn money, they can then put money in time deposits in the banking system, capitalism, or money available to those who need, need loans for whatever, the money's available in that, uh, in that medium. There's a more advanced conversation, I'll save that for later, it's called social credit theory, and we're missing some key ideas there to go further into this, but I'm going to leave it that point there for right now. Um, the other person, just uh, Bernanke being the genius and everything he is, and, and, uh, and you have to have fractional reserve. I'd like to mention a few people who said we need 100% reserves. Milton Friedman, the most open money and monetarist there is, wanted 100% reserves until the 80s when he said basically I give up, I can't convince people, I'm not going to, I can't push this anymore. Irving Fisher, the Dean of American Economics, pushed this all throughout the 20s, 30s, into the 40s. He was publishing books on this. There's a long list of people, two-thirds of American economists wanted, or uh, money and people had studied money and banking economists wanted this in the 1930s. It was the bankers themselves that made sure that this bill was left in committee. And we do not want to end the Federal Reserve System, yes, a bit as we know it today, but the Federal Reserve in the, the Need Act just goes in, becomes nationalized. Its research, its ability to put money into the private banking system if it needs to, remains, if that remains the need. But we, don't, we don't think so, but it's in the bill. There, the, the necessary research, the clearinghouse operations, all exist. The Federal Reserve exists, but it's been nationalized. And by the way, the Bank of England was nationalized at, in 1946, even during 42, the, uh, the Archbishop said, of Canterbury said, what should be the servant has become the master. And because of his talk on money, the, the, the Bank of England was nationalized in 46, and the outcome of that, even though 97% of, of uh, English money is, comes from private sources today, in their system, but at least the Bank of England and King, the president, uh, can say, we have a serious problem here, and we have to, need, we have to consider structural change, and they're much more open to this conversation than we are today. Okay. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you all for coming. This is the College of Complexes, and we're out of here. That's right. Just the last word. On, there's a wonderful book for the people who brought up the last few issues. It's called Dead, the First 5,000 Years, and it discusses hunters and gatherers and, and the creation of money, and it's a wonderful look at money. Dead, dead the first 5,000 years.